Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 16th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Could I ask everyone in the room to ensure their mobile phones are in silent? It's acceptable to use mobile devices for social media, uh, but please don't take photographs or film proceedings. Um, agenda items 1 to 11 are subordinate legislation, uh, and 1 to 10 are the consideration of five affirmative instruments. Uh, as usual, with affirmative instruments, we will have an evidence-taking session with the Minister and our officials on the instrument. And once we've had all our questions answered, we will have the formal debate on the motion. The first instrument we are looking at today is the Mental Health Absconding Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland Regulations 2017 Draft. Could I welcome to the meeting uh, Maureen Watt, Minister for Mental Health, uh, Ruth Wilson, Senior Policy Advisor, Mental Health and Protection of Rights Division, and uh, Elsa Garland, uh, Solicitor, All Scottish Government. Could I invite a brief opening statement from the Minister? Thank you very much, Convener, and thank you for providing me with the opportunity to speak about this secondary legislation that the Scottish Government is bringing forward. This legislation is part of the implementation of the Mental Health Scotland Act 2015. That 2015 Act makes changes to the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003 to allow service users with a mental disorder to access effective treatment quickly and easily. The 2015 Act also amends the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 and the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2003 to improve processes and to introduce a victim notification scheme for victims of mentally disordered offenders. Implementation of the 2015 Act is part of the Scottish Government's programme to streamline, simplify and clarify the system for efficient and effective treatment of, for people with a mental disorder. It does not seek to overhaul mental health law, simply to make those changes that need to be made to further improve the operation of the law in this area. When the provisions of the 2015 Act come into force, it will build on existing measures and the principles set out in the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003 to help ensure people with mental health problems know their rights are at the center of decisions about their own care and are empowered to participate. Today, there are five affirmative statutory instruments to talk about. One instrument is about arrangements for patients who have absconded, <clears throat> three relate to cross-border matters, and the fifth is a clarification of holding powers for nurses. As each instrument is to be considered individually, I will use that opportunity to take a a few minutes to explain those particular proposals, including our reasons behind them, before taking questions. The development of policy in this area was done in consultation with stakeholders. The draft policy proposals for these instruments were discussed with stakeholders before those proposals were finalised. Given the complexity and technical nature of some of the processes, it was not practical to run a single public consultation. In order to maximise responses, two separate consultations were conducted. The aim here was to engage as fully as possible whilst minimising pressure on stakeholders to consider several topics in one go. Policy officials also set up a reference group which not only helped shape the form of the consultations but also focused on the implementation of the 2015 Act itself. The reference group consists of, stake, of a range of stakeholders. This membership includes the Mental Health Tribunal for Scotland, Mental Welfare Commission for Scotland, professional group, service providers, rights, advocacy and service user representation organisations. The group has had a key role in providing advice and recommendations. So in summary, convener, the Scottish Government considers that implementation of the 2015 Act and introduction of these instruments will help to improve the care and treatment of people with mental disorder. And I'm happy to discuss the first instrument that the committee is to consider. Okay, uh, thank you. Could I invite any questions from members? Uh, Alex. Thank you, convener. Uh, do I go on and just introduce the first order? Yep. So, okay. so the first order. Yes. Yep. So the first order on absconding, the first instrument uh, relates principally to the provision of medical treatment to persons who have absconded to Scotland from elsewhere. 
These regulations have a dual purpose. Firstly, to provide a process for return of patients who have absconded from another EU member state. And secondly, to allow for treatment of absconding patients pending their return. Sometimes when, a pa when patients who are mentally disordered are detained in hospital, they leave without the agreement of staff or go missing. This can be a concern because many patients are detained in hospital in the first place because they are at risk of harming others or themselves in some way. What we propose is to make provision which follows the principle of least restriction and allows for that person to receive medical treatment for their mental disorder. It is envisaged that this would be used in circumstances where the absconding person is likely to be in Scotland for a short period before returning to their home jurisdiction once transport is arranged. <clears throat> At present, there is no provision in the mental health legislation which provides a framework to authorise the giving of treatment to a person who, have, who has absconded from detention in another jurisdiction and then taken into custody pending return. We therefore propose to replicate some of the provisions which allow treatment of patients detained in hospital in Scotland. These regulations set out a clear process for considering treatment, which includes confirming that the absconding person is subject to measures that correspond to Scottish measures involving detention. In most cases, we hope the person will be returned to their home jurisdiction within a few days. We have focused on what best meet the needs of the person, and therefore it has to be established that the absconding person has a mental disorder and where they are not liable to be taken into custody under the absconding regulations, it would be necessary to detain them for treatment of that disorder. I appreciate that one stakeholder may prefer we take a different route, for example, recommending that absconding persons should be made subject to a short-term detention certificate. We have looked at the evidence in detail and officials have spoken about their concerns. They acknowledge that a short-term detention certificate may not be appropriate in all cases and we consider that additional provisions that they request are not needed. We are confident that the proposed regulations are a suitable and proportionate way of allowing a person to be returned to their home jurisdiction where that is appropriate and receive treatment for their mental disorder as required pending their return. During the consultation process, most respondents agreed with our proposals. The best interests of the person should be uppermost in any decision. The, 20, the 2003 Act contains the right to access support from an independent advocate to anyone in Scotland with a mental disorder as defined by the Act. This means that any patient who comes under the absconding regulations would have a right to access support from an advocate. If there's likely to be a longer delay, then it would be open to the medical practitioner responsible for the person's treatment to consider whether the person should be brought within the Scottish system. So I'm happy now to take questions on the proposals. OK, thank you, Alex. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Minister. Thank you for coming to see us. Um, at the top of your remarks, you uh, referenced the fact that these um, instruments were done in consultation with groups of stakeholders, and, and absolutely accept that. That may well be. However, it's clear from briefings that members of my fellow members of this committee have received since Sam Mage that not all concerns that were raised in that consultation process have been acted on. Um, it's particularly around um, these regulations on absconding that I want to address some questions. Firstly, um, in response to uh, well, the, dra the, the draft regulations allow the RMO to authorise any person to take someone into custody. And uh, arguably that definition is very vague. It doesn't ensure that person specified has appropriate qualifications or experience uh, to fulfil these duties. Now, Sam H sort of flagged this up during the consultation process. Can you tell us why you've decided to omit any kind of uh, qualification threshold for um, those people who can take... Uh, patients into custody? Um, well, yeah, some each um, have 
uh, I should say sort of in general terms, um, we are aware of Sam H's concerns and my officials uh, met with Sam H, uh, our representative from Sam H uh, last week and um, we thought that we had allayed most of their fears and concerns in relation um, to these orders. However, once that person went back and discussed it with colleagues, um, it doesn't seem that that um, uh, is the case. So, um, you know, perhaps more reassurance of other members of, of SAMH uh, is required. But this change is needed because there are cur there's currently a difference between the list of persons who can take an absconding civil patient into custody and return them and the corresponding list for mentally disordered offenders. So um, there is a list of people who can take people in... Uh, into detention, in, into custody. Um, um, but the new provisions now offer similar specified persons by including persons authorised by the patient's responsible medical officer. So the policy objective is to make both provisions similar so as to allow an RMO to authorise a person to take a mentally disordered offender into custody and return them to the hospital or other place from which the patient absconded. So the accompanying code of practice will make clear which factors an RMO should consider when specifying a person. Well, I, I'm grateful for that answer. Um, obviously, because this is subject to the affirmative procedure, we can't amend this. So you're asking the committee to rubber stamp something that, well, not all of us are entirely happy with. And I'm just concerned that I don't see what um, weakens the government position by just amending this to taking this back, redrafting it and amending it to include even just the word qualified and then in that subsequent guidance delineating exactly what we mean by qualification um, for those people because it does seem it could be open to interpretation and may be misused. So qualified persons are already specified, such as members of hospital staff, mental health officers and constables. This addition allows the responsible medical officer to make a decision about the suitability of a person to take an absconding patient into custody and return them to hospital or another place that they have absconded from. So the accompanying code of practice will make clear what matters and an, uh, an, an RMO should consider when specifying a person. But with respect, just listing groups of people that can do it doesn't specify what qualifications they should hold or expertise or experience. So I'm not satisfied that that qualification threshold has been met. Well, um, I don't know if one of the officials want to come in, but in terms of what happens at the moment, you know, those, those people, the RMO... Um, is always the person who who is is um, uh, is there and, and takes uh, the decision in the end of the day. Yeah. But, uh, that yeah, all I was going to add was that um, this is an addition which allows an RMO to use their judgment about who's best placed to take that person into custody and so to fulfil that that role. So he, they'll they'll look at who's best placed at that moment and from, from the prescribed list. I mean, judgment error uh, element there, which causes me concern, um, because without specifying and just saying hospital staff, quote unquote, can take somebody into custody, um, might then, you know, lead the RMO to infer that any member of hospital staff could perform that role. Whereas actually, given, you know, the distress uh, that a, the person in question might be under, they might have been without their medication, usual treatment and support for some time. This is, could be a particular, particularly charged situation, may require a very finesse skill set. Then I, I don't think we've covered that by just saying it's up to the RMO and really it can be anyone from hospital staff. Um, if I may, just, sorry, just to clarify what the amendment to these regulations is doing, um, it's simply replicating the system that we have for civil mm. patients at the moment. We have that list at the moment of... Um, mental health officer, constable, member of staff of hospital, and then any other person um, authorised by the RMO. And so we're simply replicating that for offenders who have absconded within Scotland. So, um, and therefore leaving some flexibility for the RMO to, to as um, my policy colleague said, to consider who they think is most suitable at that time. 
I, I'm absolutely all for giving the RMO flexibility, but I, I also want parameters around that flexibility. And I don't understand what the problem is with actually just bottoming out within guidance and specifically the word qualified in the actual regulation so that um, RMOs feel that they have the confidence to discharge that responsibility. Well, uh, as Ailsa said, it's, you know, bringing it into line with what exists for their other patients at the moment. I mean, we're talking about very few people and we're talking about somebody who is at in danger of being a risk to themselves or a risk to others. And I think you would agree that perhaps speed might be of the essence in some cases in order that we can quickly ascertain what the problem is and make sure that that person is given the best possible treatment as quickly as possible and returned to uh, from whence they have come as quickly as possible. Well, I, I don't question that. Speed is obviously important, but at the same time... Um, when you have to make speedy decisions, you can often make the wrong decisions. I just want to protect the RMOs. I want to protect the patients they're dealing with. And if that is bringing it into line with um, how it is for uh, the situation with domestic patients, then perhaps the situation with domestic patients needs to be tightened up and more specified. So, I, I'm, I'm still not quite happy with this. If it may, sorry, just to clarify again, it is, this is all just about domestic offenders, offenders who, who have absconded within Scotland. Right. This particular amendment, we're amending sorry, yeah. two different sets of regulations. It's replicating what we have in the civil system at the moment. So RMOs are already making decisions about persons that they think appropriate yeah. for civil patients. So it's just... It's just cr creating a similar system. Um, I'm not sure whether we're aware that there are issues in them making those decisions at the moment for the civil patients, so we're simply um, okay. replicating it for offenders. I don't think we're going to reach an agreement on this, but I'm not satisfied that that qualification threshold has been met. Can I move on, if I may, Kamina, yeah. to um, the, the other problem that Sam H raised with us, and that is about medical treatment for people who have absconded from jurisdictions out with Scotland. Um, as the regulations stand, the government is proposing to treat people over several days without the same authorisation from mental health law that would be provided for someone resident in Scotland receiving treatment. People absconding into Scotland could be subject to prolonged detention and treatment without the right of appeal, um, which could be seen as an infringement of their human rights. I'm in particular interested in the fact that this has come to the European Court of Human Rights before from a case in Finland, um, whereby the judgment of that court said that, uh, that um, forced administration medication represents a serious interference with a person's physical integrity and must accordingly be based on a law that guarantees proper safeguards are against arbitrariness. And uh, in that case, those safeguards were missing. How confident would you be that such a case were brought before the European Court of Human Rights would not be found similarly wanting? Um, well, if we're mentioning the, 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 the uh, Finland case, the X versus Finland case, and that involved quite a different set of circumstances and wasn't related to absconding. And we're content that these regulations do provide significant safeguards for the treatment of those who abscond to Scotland from another jurisdiction. I mean, such medical treatment can only be given where the absconding person is subject to a measure in their home jurisdiction that corresponds to certain Scottish measures involving detention, all of which contain safeguards for the patients involved. Additionally, the absconding person needs to be medically examined before treatment is given, and it needs to be established that they have a medical disorder, uh, and that, would, that they would need to be detained for the purposes of giving them treatment um, and that without treatment, there would be a significant risk to the safety and welfare of the absconding person or to others. Um, and in terms of um, the, the safeguards, um, the, um, with no reason, um, you know, our, our mental health legislation is rights-based, and we've sought to reflect that in these regulations. So for some individuals, compulsory treatment is used to provide the person with medical treatment to alleviate suffering and for the protection of both the person and others. And 
and compulsory treatment, as you know, is only allowed in very, very strict um, circumstances. Okay. So, so these so absconding patients um, uh, are covered by by the same safeguards. Okay. So going back to the Finland judgment, I mean, we can't hypothecate what circumstances that would be applied in Scots law in terms of individual circumstances that might occur with patients absconding into Scotland under these regulations. Um, you, you talk about mental health law and this being based on mental health law. The problem with this is that there is no protection afforded to these patients under mental health law because they're, they're, um, through their exclusion of provision of treatment by authorisation of 2003 and 95 Acts set out in these um, regulations, the Scottish Government proposes to provide treatment to patients without those protections. In other words, despite what you said about the, the work that was done and the agreement that was reached that we a short-term de detention certificate would not be appropriate. That's effectively what we're talking about here without um, the, the rights that are afforded in, in these regulations. Uh, if I may, Minister, thank you. Um, uh, just really to, to reiterate that the Scottish Government is completely committed to um, maintaining human rights within um, Scotland. Um, there is a clear system within um, the absconding regulations. I don't think it's really um, quite correct to say that there, that there are no um, procedures or safeguards simply because this is set out in regulations rather than in the Act itself. Um, there are a number of um, checks that need to go through gone through, for example, before somebody is, can be given medical treatment, um, it has to be established that they've got a mental disorder, that if they weren't liable to be taken into custody under the regulations, it would be necessary to detain them to give them treatment. That has to be all decided by a medical practitioner. And they also have to consider whether without treatment there would be some risk to the safety of the patient or to others. Um, there is then a process where certain sections within the 2003 Act are applied and modified so that they work appropriately for absconding persons. So I don't think that it's really correct to say that there are no, there is no kind of scheme or system and no safeguards within them. Um, it is all set out um, in some detail within the regulations themselves. But my fundamental point is that they are not afforded the same rights and protections that Scottish citizens who are protected by primary legislation would be. And I don't see why we can't um, change, take this regulation away and change it to give them those same protections? I mean, I, I think what our position is, is that, as I say, that there is a clear system there for them. It, um, it doesn't mean that something's necessarily lesser just because it's in regulations rather than in the Act itself. I mean, I take your point that they're not receiving treatment under the 2003 Act, and I think that's one of Sam H's issues. However, they, are they would be receiving treatment in accordance with the conditions and requirements of the regulations. So there is a, we feel there is a clear system there. But then access to, so just one final Very point final. is access to justice. I think that's the, the key. And uh, um, my anxiety would be that if you're not protected by primary legislation and it's <laughs> some hodgepodge under these regulations, then you won't have the just disability that you would if you were protected as Scottish patients are under primary legislation. Okay. Clear. Thank you, convener. And um, can I declare, or, or can I refer uh, members to my register of interest? I am a registered mental health nurse. Um, I'm probably one of only two people around this table who have actually worked with this legislation um, in practice. Can I just uh, clarify with you then, in terms of um, uh, one of these pa the patients that, that we're referring to, who have absconded, who, who are now in a, under a care in a in a Scottish mental health facility? what rights they have in terms of accessing advocacy, in terms of making complaints to the Mental Welfare Commission, and in and, and terms of general rights. Because obviously Alex Cole Hamilton has raised his concerns there, so can you please clarify what they, what they are and how they currently stand? Okay, so the 2015 Act builds on the rights and duties in the 2003 Act that grant the right to access support from an independent advocate. And the new provisions will um, will require local authorities, health boards, and the state hospital to provide information to the Mental Welfare Commission on how they exercise their duty to collaborate and secure advocacy services for people with a mental disorder and how they plan to do so in the future. And this will help ensure that information on the provision of advocacy is easily accessible 
and will help to ensure that independent advocacy is provided as it should be. Uh, and the Scottish Government will continue to work with the Mental Welfare Commission on the implementation of this new provision. And it should be said that the Mental Welfare Commission, as far as I understand it, are broadly in agreement with these um, sure. SSIs. Thank you. Um, can, I, can I ask, um, in terms of, we, we see for, for anyone who, who's, who's detained under the Mental Health Act in Scotland that they have a, an additional support in terms of, of a mental health officer is there and who oversees the process. Is there any plans to have mental health officers oversee any part of, of this uh, regulation? Um, so um, there is a, there's no statutory role uh, for an MHO under these regulations as they're not as they're not being detained under the 2003 Act. However, best practice will be set out in the statutory guidance on how a clinical team uh, will engage with social work. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that reassurance. Can I just ask yeah. one, one fine, then question, convener? Um, obviously, Alex Cole Hamilton has raised concerns there about RMOs uh, deciding who would go to uh, bring someone back into custody. I've personal experience of, of, of fulfilling that role. Um, and uh, my understanding is that for the, the vast majority of cases it would be um, RMNs and uh, nurses who are working in the ward that that patient has absconded from that they are part of their wider clinical team in terms of perhaps some of the community staff who have been involved in working with that particular patient. Do you see any difference um, with this, this regulation coming in? Would, that, would, would you envisage that it would be similar people who would be involved with similar experience and similar levels of qualification? I think it would be absolutely the same, and I bow to your practical knowledge uh, in this field. I think you're absolutely right. Okay, thank you. Colin? Good morning to the uh, panel. Obviously, under the current process, if someone requires further treatment over a longer period of time, doctors are required to issue short-term detention certificates at the point that, that Alec raised. That's the current system. What are the disadvantages of maintaining the current system? Do you want um, to take it? Um, yeah, so by, by making a patient subject to a short-term detention certificate, you're effectively bringing them into the Scottish system and then to transfer them back to their home jurisdiction, they'd have to go through the cross-border transfer process, um, which, which may involve a, more of a lengthy process than might otherwise be the case, whereas um, allowing for medical treatment under the absconding regulations, um, still, as I said, sets out a clear process for that treatment to be given and conditions under which it can be given, but then allows uh, when that patient is is in a in a kind of a medically um, fit to return to their own country that that, that, they can, that can be done without any delay. How many people are we talking about that you require to change the current process? And how many people you refer to? I think the minister said very few. Um, so we're dealing with very few people but you require to change the current system for how many people? So I think um, it's a few people. Yeah. There's, um, there's no official statistics have, have been kept, but you'll see from people's evidence and from our evidence gathering that we are talking about limited numbers, but I think we just need to be clear that at the moment there is no provision for medical treatment, and this is what these regulations are doing. We're introducing that provision at the moment. People have been doing a work round, and that is why the STDC has, has came into play. But as, as Ailsa has pointed out, the one one consequence of putting people in an STDC is they're, they will largely be in Scotland for a longer period of time. Uh, Alison. I've been listening to, to, to the discussion with interest, but I'm still not entirely clear um, how the Minister will ensure that the person authorised by a responsible medical officer w to take someone into custody will have the appropriate experience and qualifications. I'm still not clear why we don't have that prescribed list. And what it really does concern me is that one of our foremost mental health organisations has <laughs> such reservations about what you're proposing. Um, and, you know, they've also provided follow-up evidence to the committee saying they remain concerned that the regulations as currently drafted don't include an appeals procedure and provide no access for mental health to a mental health officer for people who won't be familiar with the law here. Um, could you perhaps address some of those questions, Minister? Uh, 
What else? Did you, uh, sorry, do you want to take that in terms of the uh, the pe having a, a person available? But what we're looking at is um, that all patients will have a right to an independent advocate, and as part of of the access to that service, then the advocate will make sure that the patient is aware of the rights, as well, indeed, the um, the treating clinician has a role to ensure that that person is aware of what has happened to them and um, and what their rate, rights should be. Is it? I mean, is is it your view that? Do you not believe that there should be a prescribed list? I'm trying to get. I just can't quite understand why you don't agree with what Sam H are asking for. Well, there is an existing list that has prescribed categories of people, and all we're doing is adding this um, new line that allows an RMO to say who is the best person in that circumstances, who's most qualified in that moment of time to take the person into custody. And as Ailsa said previously, we're just equaling up what already happens in civil um, cases to those for um, mentally disordered offensers who are likely to abscond during a transfer process. So why is it the case that Sam H are concerned by these? by this legislation? So I think, I think you're raising a, a couple of different issues there, if I may. Um, uh, so the first one is to do that has been, uh, we have discussed already, is to do with um, RMOs and them being able to authorise somebody, in addition to the people that already set out in, in, in regulations, they can themselves authorise somebody that they think is suitable to take an offender into custody. And then there are separate issues that Sam H have raised um, about um, concerns, where, for example, I'll give an example of the, the Finnish um, human rights case um, that we've, we've discussed as well, where they've said that, that they feel that there's a lack of um, a proper process. And what we're saying is that there is a process set out in the regulations and that, that, that we feel that that's um, uh, a, a sufficient process and also allows, in these circumstances, somebody to be returned fairly speedily to their home jurisdiction, which is probably going to be the best for them in the circumstances rather than being in a country that's um, that's not their own. Um, so, yeah, so I think, I think that's what, what, just to say that there, I think there are two different issues there that... Um, okay. Thank you, Convener. Um, and t depriving somebody of their liberty is a huge step. And uh, I think for me the issue within this is that, that word any, any person, I think that's the problem. I think that's the problem that a number of us have. Uh, and I would ask, you know, I think the government really needs to reflect on that. I think that is that is a problem. Do, do you see it as being a problem? Or yeah, is it if I may, I think, so I, I do think perhaps that the two, there's two different issues perhaps that are getting um, amalgamated into one. So the RMO issue is about simply adding to the list of people who can take an offender into custody for the purposes of returning them. So these are absconding offenders within Scotland. And then for um, absconders from other jurisdictions, we're extending the existing regime that we have, the, the, the existing regime for the taking into custody and return of the absconding persons. We're extending those to people from other EU member states and also to allow for medical treatment, which is not currently provided for in the 2003 Act. And we're doing that, if I may, sorry, um, just while <laughs> um, I have the floor, um, just, to, just to reiterate that these are, we're using powers that were in, in the 2015 Act that have been used to expand the regulation making powers so we could make this specific provision for these um, two different t categories of the people coming from the EU and also to apply to all absconders this ability to give them medical treatment. So um, it, it has been as well sort of fully debated within the bill's process and we're, um, we're not, I would, I would submit, doing anything that's particularly unusual looking at those um, new powers that we have as revised in the 2003 Act. Okay, and, and the second element that I have concerns about is the fact that uh, for those absconding to Scotland, then no legal right to challenge and uh, challenge treatment and no right of appeal. Uh, I have a problem with that. Fundamentally, have a problem with that. Um, however, um, would anyone like to else yeah. like to? Yeah. Well, 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 some some s some H are suggesting that regulations offer the possibility of deprivation of liberty for an unlimited period without appeal, and we've no reason to expect that this would be the case. I mean, our intention has been clear from the outset that the absconding regulations 
are subject to specific conditions and any treatment should only be given for um, a short period of time. And in most cases, we'd hope that absconding persons would be returned to uh, their original jurisdiction within um, a, a, in a few days. And, you know, we have consulted on this issue. Um, um, uh, there was no clear consensus from respondents regarding what the relevant time period should be. And this comes back to your question about a short term uh, detention certificate. And because there's a range of variables involved, um, you know, for example, whether the person is well enough to travel and, and what transport arrangements um, have been put in case. I mean, each case would be different and there would have to be a clinical decision on what is best for that particular person. Um, and that it will be supported by uh, guidance to determine, uh, as I say, the best course of action. And that's why we're saying it would be inappropriate for the regulations, for example, to specify um, a time limit. Um, okay. I wonder if I may just Very briefly. Brief the convener. Just to sort of clarify again, these are absconding people who are subject to measures equivalent to Scottish detention in their own home jurisdiction. So it's not that we are um, taking them into custody, you know, as, a, as an initial measure of somebody. Um, they already, they're already subject to measures in their country. They've come to Scotland and it's been established that they have absconded and they're being taken into custody for the purposes of return. Um, so it's not... Think, it's a I, think we get that. Thank you. I think we get that. Thank um. you. But, you know, I, under, I, I accept that this is extremely complicated and especially since most of us weren't involved in the passage of the of the act, the 2015 uh, Act. I mean, you know, if the committee would like, we could have a, an informal briefing um, to set out exact in more detail and perhaps answer more questions about 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 this. Thank you for the offer, but we and we will consider that. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, are they okay in terms of their contributions? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd prefer to do that and take it away. Um, rather than, you know, see this go down, obviously. Because that's not going to help anybody in terms of this, um, the, the Act. Uh, do you want to withdraw? Well, I mean, I, I've only heard from very few members as to what they feel about, the, about this regulation, Mr. this we're, we're, SSI. We're about to move on to the, uh, the debate on the, uh, the, uh, the SSI, so I think at this point it would be... Well, we can have the discussion, and then it's up to yourself whether you move the uh, move it or whether you withdraw. Well, if, uh, Would you if, prefer you, if, you, okay. if you want to have yeah. the discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, we now move on to agenda item two, which is the formal debate on the affirmative SSI, in which we've just taken evidence. Um, can I remind the committee that uh, members should not put questions to the minister during uh, formal debates, and officials um, must not speak in the debate either. Um, we would usually at this point invite the Minister to move the motion. Uh, I move the motion. Uh, okay, and can I invite members to contribute to the debate? Alex. Thank you, Convener. Um, I am grateful for the uh, clarity that um, Minister and officials have sought to bring, yet it has not given me satisfaction that the concerns addressed by fellow committee members and by Sam H in their briefing to us have been met. I don't think either that an informal briefing around the technical aspects of the 2015 Act would actually assuage that any further. I don't think that what's being asked of the government in respect of um, taking these, uh, this, these instruments away and redrafting um, are particularly onerous. I don't think they will um, jeopardise the thrust or the spirit of what the Scottish Government is trying to do. Um, I think that, if anything, they will improve these instruments and will offer protection both for staff and patients in respect of the observance of human rights and not leave us open to future litigation at a European level. Clear? Uh, that's 
very much, convener. Um, I'm obviously speaking to this in, in, with a background of professional knowledge. Um, I hear the concerns that some of uh, my fellow committee members have, but um, would offer them the reassurance that you know professional judgment in in all areas in terms of looking at the patient as as the the centre of all care in mental health is is how all healthcare professionals practice, and um, that this is not as as a uh, Different to, uh, or is it not as, as a different change to legislation as perhaps they might feel that it is? And that in actually, in actual practice, this is this is looking as at expediting patient care and actually providing a, a, a potentially a, a, a better safeguards for patient care if we have people practicing out with um, guidance currently. Anyone else? Alison? Yeah, I can't help but think that this could be improved. Um, there have been concerns raised by the committee this morning about the fact that the RMO can authorise anyone to take an absconded person into custody. And I think clarity around that prescribed list would be helpful. Um, we've also heard concerns about safeguarding people's rights, no appeals procedure outlined, no access to a mental health officer, and no mention of independent um, advocacy and uh, other members have also raised concerns about the the issuing of short-term detention certificates so I do feel that this could be brought back to committee in an improved form thank you convener thank you anyone else uh, my and Johnson said I think um, you know to date we've worked hard to make sure that all legislation is built around rights-based and I just have a feeling that this doesn't feel right in, in the sense of rights and the two points you raised convener with regards to challenging uh, treatment and the right to appeal I think these are two areas um, I think we'd all appreciate if um, this side was rewritten to take into these two points into account anyone else okay Minister, in reflecting on what the committee has said, do you still wish to um, uh, pursue the motion today? I think, um, if I could say, uh, Convener, that I think Alex Cole Hamilton is perhaps, you know, wanting the whole act revisited, and we're not in that position. This is um, uh, subordinate legislation to bring the act into place, and. Um, as has been said by myself and my officials, um, it is absolutely rights-based uh, legislation and you know, further details Minister, will Minister, be set uh, out uh, in the Code we, of Practice. We, we are very short of time today. Yes, sure. I, I really need to get you to decide whether you want to withdraw your motion or whether you want to pursue. Um, well, I think um, I'll press the um, motion. Press the amendment, OK. The question is that motion S5M05753 be approved. Are we all agreed? No. Okay, there will be a division. Um, could I um, see those in uh, for the SSI? Please put your hands up very obviously. And those against? And any abstentions? Any abstentions? Okay, there was there were uh, seven votes against, two votes for, and three abstentions. No. Six against. Sorry. Six against. Apologies. Six votes against, two votes for, and three abstentions. Thank you very much. Um, and the motion. Sorry. So therefore, the motion was not agreed. Yeah, the motion was not agreed. Sorry. Um, could I uh, suspend uh, briefly to allow the change of officials to accompany the minister?
Uh, agenda item three is the second instrument we're looking at today, mental health cross-border transfer uh, patients subject to requirements other than detention, Scotland Regulations 2017 draft. The Minister is now joined by Eleanor Stanley, Policy Officer, Nicola Patterson, Head of uh, Protection Rights Unit, Mental Health and Protection of Rights Division, and Fraser Goff, uh, Parliamentary Council, uh, all Scottish Government. Um, could I invite a brief opening statement from the Minister? Uh, so I'm introducing three instruments covering cross-border issues, two related to cross-border transfers and the third related to cross-border visits. The overall aim is to amend these regulations to reflect the changes in the 2015 Act and in the case of the cross-border transfer regulations to improve the operation of the regulations. The 2015 Act introduces a requirement that regulations related to the cross-border transfer of patients detained or otherwise in hospital make provision for the named person to appeal against a decision to transfer a patient from Scotland. There are also changes in the 2015 Act allowing certain persons to act where there is no named person. These changes are reflected in these regulations alongside introducing certain other appeal rights and notification requirements based on feedback from stakeholders and the public consultation. The 2015 Act also allows for provisions in all three sets of regulations to be extended to patients subject to measures in other EU member states. Currently, there is no process under the regulations for transferring a patient to Scotland from out with the UK. By way, for example, this would include a situation where somebody from Scotland is taken unwell and detained under mental health legislation whilst in an EU country on holiday and would want to return home to Scotland. By extending these provisions, we aim to fulfil the intention of the 2015 Act in providing parity of treatment under the law for patients subject to measures in other EU member states. Similarly, changes to cross-border visits legislation will extend the ability for an, ex escorted, uh, an escorted visit by a patient, for example, to visit an unwell relative to patients subject to measures in other EU states. In addition to this, there are adjustments to the process when Scottish ministers make a decision to grant a warrant to transfer a patient from Scotland. This includes introducing a fast-tracked transfer process where the patient and any named person agree to such a transfer. This is based on feedback from stakeholders that it would be of benefit to any patient who agrees to a transfer, is eager to transfer quickly and does not intend to appeal the transfer. This change would avoid, un avoid unnecessary delay where the patient is in agreement with the proposed move. move. I have set out the most significant changes in the regulations. The bulk of the changes are to the transfer of patients who are detained or otherwise in hospital. Corresponding changes are made where relevant to the regulations concerning the transfer of patients subject to community measures. The changes across the regulations, in particular the cross-border transfer regulations, will improve the, will improve the effective operation of these regulations to the benefit of individuals who are transferring. Thank you very much. Any questions from members? No. Thank you. We now move on to agenda item four, which is a formal debate on the affirmative SSI in which we've just taken evidence. Can I remind uh, the committee and others members should, um, uh, members should not put questions to the minister and officials may not speak in the debate. Um, could I invite the minister to move motion S5M 05951? Moved. Thank you. Any members wish to contribute? No. Um, the question is that motion S5M 05951 be approved. Are will agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. Uh, agenda item uh, five, subordinate legislation. Uh, it's the third instrument we're looking at today, mental health, cross-border transfer, patients subject to detention requirements or otherwise in hospital Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 draft. Could I invite an opening statement from the Minister? Thank you, Convener. The remaining affirmative... Oh, we covered it all first. Oh, sorry. sorry. Statement from the Minister? Across the Covered by that, that as previous as well, yeah. sorry. Yeah, okay, that's fine. 
if maybe you could make that clear, then yes, that would be helpful. Um, any uh, uh, questions? No. Um, we now move on to agenda item six, which is a formal debate on the uh, affirmative essay sign, which will just take in evidence. Could remind the committee and others um, should not put questions to the minister during formal debates, and officials must not speak in the debate. Can I uh, invite the minister to move the motion? Moved. Um, I invite any members to contribute to the debate. Nope. Um, Minister, do you wish to add anything? No. Um, the question is that uh, motion S5M 05950 be approved. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, next item is agenda item seven. That's the fourth instrument we're looking at today. Uh, Mental Health Cross-Border Visit Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 draft. Again, has that been covered in your statement? Thank you. Any questions from members? No. We now move on to agenda item eight, which is the formal debate on the affirmative essay sign, which we'll just take in evidence. Again, uh, members should not put questions to the minister or and officials must not speak in the debate. Um, any contributions from members? So can I invite the Minister to move the motion? Moved. Uh, any contributions? No. Uh, the question is that motion S5M05752 be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item nine is the fifth. Suspend. Oh, sorry. You've got new officials coming in. Sorry. Suspend for uh, to change your officials. Uh, agenda item nine is the fifth instrument we're looking at today, the Criminal Justice and Licence in Scotland Act 2010, Consequential Provisions Order 2017 Draft. The uh, Minister is now joined by Innes Five, Team Leader Mental Health and Protection of Rights Division, and uh, Lindsay Anderson, Solicitor, All Scottish Government. Uh, could the Minister make a brief opening statement? Thank you, Convener. Uh, this remaining affirmative instrument which I present today relates to an amendment to the 2003 Act. This provision will help clarify that nurses are able to use their power to hold patients for up to three hours to allow an examination to take place if the patient is in hospital for treatment as part of a community payback order. The 2015 Act will simplify the nurses' holding power to support practitioners and help patients know their rights in this situation. The power is currently available in respect of patients in hospital by virtue of a probation order with a mental health treatment requirement. The community payback order was introduced by the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010 and has largely replaced the probation orders. The mental health treatment requirement is rarely used by the courts when making community payback orders. However, it was considered helpful to put beyond doubt that persons in hospital for mental health treatment by virtue of a community payback order, can also be detained in this way. To be clear, this instrument does not extend the reach of the nurses' holding power provision. It simply clarifies it to reflect the fact that probation orders have been largely replaced by community payback orders. Thank you. Any questions? Alison? Um, yes, if I may, convener. Um, can I ask the Minister, as community payback orders were the result of legislative change arising from the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act in 2010, um, why there has been such a delay? Uh, well, the 2015 Act provisions simplifying the nurses' holding power is due to come into force in June 2017. Uh, the power is currently described as being available in respect of patients in hospital by virtue of a probation order with a mental health treatment requirement. So the community payback order was introduced by, as I said, the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act 2010 and, um, as I said, largely replaced 
the probation order. So while the law operates in such a way that the power can already be interpreted as covering the new community payback orders, it was considered helpful to clearly state on the face of the legislation that persons in hospital for mental health treatment by virtue of a community payback order can also be detained in this way. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask a question, then, Convener? Um, can I ask what training and training materials will be made available for mental health officers when these regulations come into force? Ines, do you want to take that? Um, yes. The, the regulations themselves represent um, improvements to support practitioners and not wholesale changes, as they might have seen with the introduction of the 2003 Act, for example. Um, so we have been, officials have been working with um, the Scottish Association of Social Workers and Social Work Scotland on the implementation of the 2015 Act, including these um, instruments. And... Um, We've been providing content and information to support updates to local training uh, because I think that's the, the best um, environment for this, uh, the changes to be introduced to practitioners. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Any other questions? Nope. We now move on to Agenda Item 10, which is a formal debate on the uh, affirmative SSI, which, on which we've just taken evidence. Can I remind the committee and others, uh, members should not put questions to the Minister during formal debates, and officials may not speak in the debate. Can I invite the Minister to move the motion? Moved. Thank you. Any members wishing to contribute? No. Thank you. Um, uh, the question is that motion S5M05949 be approved. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Motion approved. Thank you. Uh, agenda item 11 is subordinate legislation and we have four negative instruments. They are the Mental Health Tribunal for Scotland Practice and Procedure No. 2 Amendment Rules 2017, Mental Health Conflict of Interest Scotland Regulations 2017, Mental Health Patient Representation Prescribed Persons Scotland Regulations 2017 and Mental Health Certificates for Mental Medical Treatment Scotland Regulations 2017. Uh, any comments uh, from the Minister uh, on these instruments? No. Any comments from members? No. The Delegated uh, Powers and Law Reform Committee has not yet considered these instruments, and the Committee will therefore consider the instruments again at its next meeting following that Committee's report on the instruments. Could I suspend uh, to allow a change of panel and thank the Minister for attendance this morning?
Uh, agenda item 12 on our agenda is an evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport on integration authorities engagement with stakeholders and the draft budget 2017-18. Can I welcome uh, to the committee uh, Shona Robinson, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, Jeff Huggins, Director of Health and Social Care Integration and Christine uh, McLaughlin, Director of Health Finance, all Scottish Government. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement? Thanks, uh, convener, for the invitation to speak to you today. I, I welcome the committee's interest in the integration of health and social care and this opportunity to discuss integration authorities' engagement with stakeholders and the, the budget setting process in more detail. The budget setting process is important, not least because integration authorities now manage more than £8 billion of resources that used to be managed separately by NHS boards and local authorities. Uh, big amount of money, yet at the same time um, a limited amount of money that we recognise needs to be used more effectively and efficiently. And by that, I mean we need to shift resources to more preventative activity and reduce the reliance on reactive hospital-based care, providing the right care at the right time in the right place, which I hope as often as possible will be in someone's home. But integration should not be seen to be just about budgets or uh, it's also about improving outcomes for, for people, and that is why I particularly want to focus on stakeholder engagement. This was at the, the heart of our legislation to integrate health and social care, putting service users at the centre along with service providers to make sure their voices are heard, that they are fully involved in decision making and planning. Uh, we should recognise that integration is still at a very early stage and is still evolving. I think we've seen a, a lot of progress on ensuring proper engagement of key stakeholders rather than tokenistic involvement, but acknowledge that we still have some way to go. I think this was recognised at earlier evidence sessions. For example, the Coalition of Carers noted that they've seen a, a lot of improvements in best practice development. At the same session, uh, Voluntary Action South Lanarkshire highlighted their involvement in strategic commissioning. The strategic planning group in each integration authority, along with locality planning arrangements, is where engagement is particularly important. The, those people who know best how services should be delivered will be those who receive those services and those who provide them. This uh, empirical evidence must be supported by data, data that must be readily available and accessible to stakeholders. We're working with NHS National Services Scotland to further develop a link to data set of health and social care data known as SOURCE, which understand my officials have demonstrated to the committee, and this will be key to informing future decision making. Um, clearly, this open sharing of data will need trust between and across sectors, and we're already seeing where this can work with improvements to home care in Highland, where the local Scottish care representative, representative co-chairs the strategic planning group. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, OK, thank you very much. Uh, Alison. Thank you, convener, um, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I very much appreciate the tone of the Cabinet Secretary's contribution there, because it is clear that there is still work to be done around stakeholder engagement. Um, Amy Dalrymple of Alzheimer's Scotland, in, in her submission, noted that she attended a meeting of an umbrella group of organisations and spoke to a chief officer <coughs> of a health and social care partnership. And when she was suggesting the sort of important contribution that third sector organisations could make, uh, she says, the response I got is that it would be very welcome if we were to help communicate why certain decisions had been made, you know, rather than being involved in that decision making process. Um, and, you know, Andrew Strong of the Health and Social Care Alliance states that at the IGB governance level, the relationships between the statutory sector and third sector, independent sector, and people who use supporting services is inherently unequal. And he goes on to mention the nature of voting rights and the number of people on the board. So I'd like to ask, is local co-production achievable if organisations like the Alliance um, are suggesting that these relationships are inherently unequal? Um, I think, as I said in my opening statement, that there are good examples of good practice, but clearly, um, Alison Johnson has highlighted um, a, a few examples of not so good practice and I think with across a number of fronts um, given that the life of the integration authorities is, is still a, a fairly early stage what we're seeing is good practice and across a, no, a number of fronts within many uh, integration authorities but it's fair to say perhaps a further 
uh, journey to travel for others. And I think in terms of the, the level of uh, engagement, uh, that is the case. And I think we are... Uh, there has been good practice that has put um, stakeholders very much at the centre of, of uh, planning and decision making. And it certainly should never be seen as just a, 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 a route or a, a method of communicating decisions made by others. That is not the spirit of what was intended at all. So, you know, work in progress. And I would be the first uh, to acknowledge that in terms of the Alliance uh, and obviously the, the Alliance are a very important partner in working to build the, the capacity of, uh, of communities and third sector organisations uh, around uh, this, this agenda. Um, when the Parliament passed the, the, the legislation uh, on integration, it, it considered carefully some of the, the structural issues. There was a long debate about, for example, the voting rights of, of indi individual members of the board. And its conclusion uh, was that it is only proper for voting rights on the use of, of such significant public budgets to be held by those members of the boards who are publicly accountable, i.e. the elected members of councils and non-exec members of health boards. Um, so, you know, and I, and that's important. However, that shouldn't mean that, uh, that the, the roles of stakeholders are, um, are limited uh, to providing the, um, uh, the communication channel of decisions made by others that was not neither was that the intention or the spirit of of the legislation um, it is really important um, as the legislation lays out in considerable detail that IJBs engage fully with stakeholders and partners and that was very made very very clear um, and it's also important that third sector partners who can come from a disparate range of organisations organise themselves effectively to engage in the process and a lot of work and support and actually quite a, a lot of resources have been put into helping that to be the case. So um, in summary, work in progress, but there are some really, really good examples of good practice. And what we would want to do is to, to help to roll out that good practice and to, to help to address some of the less than good practice. Okay. Can I ask another question, Katharina? Um, thank you. Claire Cairns of the Coalition of Carers um, states, that this is really about other barriers to being involved in that process fully. You know, some of them are about cash. Um, and transport and access to meetings. And she says, we hope that carers would get all their transport and replacement care costs reimbursed, but that is not always the case. Some carers use their own direct payments when they attend meetings, and that reduces the short breaks they get themselves. So these are other issues that are stopping people being fully involved. So perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could address the question of where should resources and support come from to enable stakeholders to fully participate in local service planning? I mean, there, there, are, there is funding available for uh, third sector interfaces, as, as we, we call them, um, that have been uh, resourced. I think it's about eight million to the end of March 2018. Uh, we would expect integration authorities to ensure that those who are participating are able to do so without detriment. And I, I would be concerned if that if that's the case. And that's something we would certainly want to pick up with the coalition of carers because some people are giving off their time. Uh, and if they have responsibilities that make it more difficult for them to do that, then they shouldn't be disadvantaged. Jeff, do you want to... It's certainly something that we can pick up with chief officers and we can act on the basis of that to understand how they are actually meaningfully engaging people um, and we can certainly work, work through that. As the Cabinet Secretary said, there is um, more than 8 million available for the third sector interfaces to March of next year and then a further 4 million to September and you know, beyond that we'll need, we'll need, we'll need to see how, how we continue to take that forward. Could, could I just say something on the, on, the, on the first question that you asked as well? Is the 8 million and the 4 million for? There's to support the third sector interface organisations in terms of the local to support to the third and voluntary sector in terms of the engagement with integration. Thank you. So, so it's, it's, for, it's for that purpose. The, 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 a, a number of the commentators that commented uh, on engagement were, were national organisations. And one of the things that we've seen is the challenges of national organisations, which have got a Scotland-wide remit, engaging with 31 integration authorities and, and in terms of what, what that actually means in practice. So each of the chief officers have had multiple applications from many of, of these organisations to spend time. 
what we what we are seeing um, is particularly with some of the work that we've done through the living wage though is that chief officers through the commissioning of local services with local providers uh, whether they're voluntary or independent are having to get into quite a different place around strategic partnership and different types of engagement to deliver on things like the living wage commitment so you may find that the experience will be variable as you say but also the experience between local third and voluntary sector organizations might be different from the nationals and, and again, I think that's just part of the working through uh, of, of integration. I, I think a key component of, also, of that is also the, the localization of the agenda, you know, the idea that you're building services within communities, not simply building a national idea of what the service is and then rolling it out, uh, because you know, the needs of different communities and different individuals are very different. So it, it might be helpful to get a bit more under the skin of the local experience. Um, because that won't always be the same as the national experience of an organisation like Alzheimer's Scotland, which are well connected, or indeed the Alliance. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Tom. Oh, thank you, convener. Good morning. Just a very quick supplementary, Cabinet Secretary. You, uh, you refer to um, IEs being um, evolving, and I think we all recognise that. We took evidence some time ago, I think, where it was made reference to in, in Highland, and with the lead, lead agency model, it really took five years for some of the fruits to start to show. Um, I just wonder, in terms of actually moving towards a, a, a genuine co-production, how long you would expect that to take? Well, we, we want that to happen as quickly as possible, but I think, in reality, there will be those who are already um, in that space of, of, mm -hmm. of uh, co-producing in the, the true sense of it. And I think you've been, you know, we've heard a, a lot of good practice. I think some of that's been shared with the, the committee. Uh, in the case of others, that they're on a, a journey and that's going to take longer. Our role and the role of um, the, the Ministerial Strategic Group, which oversees, is really to try and share the best practice and to, to help to push that agenda. And we can do that in a number of ways, through guidance, through resources, through uh, um, data sharing, um, through extolling the benefits of, of code production. Um, but inevitably, though, not all partnerships will be at the same speed um, of, of achieving that. So um, I guess as soon as possible would be the, the short answer, Jeff. I, I think the other, the other issue with it is, is that different challenges um, require different types of solution. So if you think of some of the things which appear in um, Glasgow's plan for this year, and I was, I was looking at, at it in the last few days, you know, they're looking at um, an assess to admit service um, in Glasgow hospitals to actually assess people at the point at which they present. Now, they're probably not going to co-produce that other than with staff. At, at the same time, if you're thinking about some of the work that we're seeing on the ground around isolation and loneliness, around people's access to a wider range of services like leisure and recreation, at that point you're beginning to have different types of conversation about how people live their lives. And so I, th I think you need to think about when you're applying the idea of co-production rather than seeing it as a solution to everything. And, and we are seeing that because you know, certainly chief officers, maybe slightly more across the rural landscape, are trying to tap into other assets and capabilities within communities and think about how they can use those to support people um, rather than simply thinking of another statutory or independently delivered service, you know, thinking differently about how we meet people's needs. So, so you're, you're seeing a mix of things out there. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Anyone else want to come in at this point? I wonder if I could ask in relation to um, the timescales. Um, Time is a flexible phenomenon these days. You know, a generation used to be a long time, it's not anymore. Um, but uh, at this point, you said um, the development of the new authorities are still at a very early stage, but you know, we've had two years and then we've had a year of shadow. And what kind of time frame do you think we need to get all of the different integrated authorities up to speed in terms of how they develop? Uh, alongside the stakeholder? Well, I think a lot has been achieved within what is rel a relatively short space of time of a new organisation bringing together two large organisations and different cultures. And when you think about uh, what has been achieved, you know, f so for example, let's take the, the big issue of, of uh, delayed discharge where you have... Um, uh, a, a number around, uh, I think, a third now of, of partnerships uh, having achieved um, 
uh, delay into to single figures. So if you take a, a big issue like that, that is quite an enormous achievement in a fairly short space of time. Um, so that's a kind of hard data measurement. And of course, the reports are coming out in the autumn, which will show progress across a number of the of the key outcomes of which that is one and reducing unscheduled hospital admissions. But you then have the kind of um, the there may not be um, hard data outcomes as such, but things like the level of co-production, which are um, we, we would want to see captured in the reports in terms of progress made uh, involving stakeholders in a, a meaningful way that um, is around shared decision making. And uh, so, I guess it's how do you measure success? And the hard data measurement of success will be against those outcomes. But there's a whole range of other things that are perhaps not as hard edged, but are as as important in terms of the culture and the way uh, integrated authorities go about their business and we would expect uh, um, as I understand Jeff for some of that to be captured in the reports that are coming in the autumn. Yeah we, we'd expect to see that. I, th I think the other thing which has been interesting when I've been out on the ground talking with chief officers and talking with senior managers is in, in looking at how they're thinking about the community and, and primary and social care landscape. So com conversations with a couple of the chief officers in, in terms of how they're thinking across how a range of different services provided by different professionals actually oper operate across the landscape. Uh, and I guess one of the interesting questions, you know, I asked one of the chief officers three or four weeks ago um, when I was out, so who did this job that you're doing about coordinating that landscape before? And the answer was actually nobody did, um, in that you had a social work department which was managing the social work component of it, you had a primary care commissioner who was managing the primary care, and you had a community um, health commissioner who was doing that, and they were effectively operating down sort of lines in terms of the provision of, so they were now thinking, so this is, that's not particularly visible. You, you should see the fruits of that as time goes on. But this idea that they're actually sort of thinking across the landscape about how the different services interact together, the ability to actually bring together teams that operate differently, uh, because they're no longer subject to those single siloed sort of way, way, ways of seeing things. So it, that's actually quite exciting and, and quite interesting and, it, and it's not visible unless you get under the skin and actually go down and talk to people about how things are different it's you know it's maybe a line in a report but it's of fundamental importance that different way of thinking about things um, there's undoubtedly going to be well there is uh, we know it, um, huge financial pressures on the new authorities um, so when they are making decisions over services um, there's clearly given those financial pressures, there's going to be uh, service change, significant service change. How do you see um, that public consultation and public engagement happening during that period? Uh, and is it fair that these organisations are starting on their journey effectively with such financial pressures on them? Therefore, they will take the brunt of any kickback from the community uh, when they largely can't do anything about the budget they've been handed? So, I mean, the, the, well, first of all, the, the total budget's under the control of integration authorities covering social care, primary care and unscheduled hospital care are £8.29 billion. Pounds. And, of course, health boards are required to maintain funding at 16, 17 levels, plus the additional £107 million funding for social care. So um, I think that the global... Um, the budget there is is not insignificant that is a, a big resource but the important thing about it is is how that is spent and um in terms of uh, shifting the balance of care we've been very clear uh with uh, integration authorities uh, as they have uh, themselves in their own discussions about how do you make the best use of those collective resources that can keep people out of hospital by building up community health services um, and to um, really see a, a, a change in the way that our services are delivered. So for the, for the first time, we're seeing real um, inroads into developing services that can avoid people ending up in a hospital uh, in an unscheduled care basis. Um, and that is a, a very, very uh, positive development. So they are starting life with a, a fairly a, a significant resource. I would be the first to acknowledge, though, that in the, the financial climate that we all live within, it's about making sure 
that uh, every part of the public sector makes best use of those resources. I think it is a more efficient and effective way of spending resources to keep people out of hospital when they don't need to be there and we have the best chance of achieving that through uh, the new world of integration where service change is required and obviously um, not all of that will be in the domain of major service change some of it will just be about doing things in a different way developing some of these community services that are demonstrated and have the evidence base that they work and they, they prevent people ending up in hospital. That's not necessarily in the domain of a major service change. Where there is major service change, then the processes for that are, are well laid out, and we would expect the, the public to be fully engaged with them. But we'd also expect the public to be fully engaged with some of this, the new developments. So some of the, this, the, the services that are that are working to keep people out of hospital have, have come about through the engagement of local communities and people who are receiving those services. Uh, and we know that they, they work very efficiently, and whether it's the LC service in East Lothian, where um, it's um, been very effective at, uh, at uh, triaging people, avoiding them going anywhere near an acute hospital by providing those services within someone's home. There's been a lot of public engagement around the testing of these services to make sure that they are actually meeting people's needs, that they're effective, they're safe, and they're providing a good quality service. I think the problem we are finding as a committee is, um, is identifying um, whether there is a shift in the balance of care and actually identifying whether um, actions being taken are efficient. Um, it's very difficult for us to find evidence from that, and we've heard that time and again um, from different authorities that they will tell us anecdotally what they're doing, but to try and get them to put figures on things and put numbers on things is extremely difficult. I, I accept that that's difficult. Um, it's also a very difficult thing to do. We've been talking about it for many years, but actually, uh, as I said earlier, I think this, uh, through the integration authorities, we have the best chance of doing that. We've set ourselves some very ambitious targets around the percentage of, of spend being in community services. That means that the growth of spend in community health services will be at a greater level than those in acute services. We have the annual performance reports and the data that they've agreed to, to, uh, to, to put out there in terms of showing um, uh, some of that shift in spend. So the visibility around that will be greater. Um, but the, the resources that we've allocated from the Scottish Government is in a direction of travel that will will help with the momentum of that because more money is going into primary care, into social care, into mental health uh, at a higher rate and a, a, a higher pace than that that's going into uh, uh, acute services. Um, Christine, do you want to? <clears throat> so I think I just acknowledge what what you said. It has been difficult to get that level of. Um, evidence through clear, quite straightforward reporting to show that. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of work just now, both with, with the, the NHS and with the integration authorities to try to look at how we can start to see those shifts coming through, not not just in, in funding and in, in the direction, because I think feedback is that the, the, there is more clarity about that um, direction that the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned, that we need to see that flow through in expenditure. Um, and so from 17, 18 onwards, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be looking really closely at how we can look at spend in acute sector and primary care, community care, um, look at areas like prescribing so that we can understand um, when we, when there starts to, to, to see that, that shift and if it's at the level that we would expect to see on an annual basis. So I, I agree with you that it's, it's a lot of it just now is, is what people are saying is happening, um, but I would expect to have better clarity of that so, through 1718. So therefore, at the moment, much of that is assertion. Well, it's, it's asserted it's, through funding, if I could put it that it's, way. It's an assertion that, these, that that shift is happening and it's an assertion that this will make it better and more efficient. <laughs> because we don't have the actual evidence that it is happening. Well, wait, now, what, I, we do have some, if I can just a moment. clarify. I think probably all of us around the table, in fact, probably everyone in this parliament, thinks that that is the right way to go. The problem is, we don't have evidence that it's working. So, can I, so a couple of things I would say that we've set up to, to, to be able to do that. So by doing things like giving direction about um, maintaining spend. I think that that is more than just a, an assertion because maintaining spend 
in health and social care integration means that we, we would expect to see that flow through in this financial year. Um, so just by the very nature of how um, that needs to be managed to deliver that, there, there, will, there would require to be some shifts in this year. So I think it's more than, than a, a, an assertion that that happens. Um, by putting money into primary care transformation and have that investment in new models come through, then that, that is clearly money that is going to be spent in those areas that wouldn't be spent in the acute sector. So I think there is there is sufficient um, building blocks for that shift to take place. What we, ha we will see as we go through 17-18 is the extent to which we see the um, the expenditure in those areas and the exact value of it. But I don't, I don't think that it's just an assertion because I think there's been enough of a shift in the direction about funding. That's really what I'm yeah, trying to distinguish. The money can be shifted. What we don't know is if it's being used more effectively. That's what we don't know as yet. I mean, there's obviously, you know, we, we've set the, the ambition by 2021-22 that we expect to see more than 50% of frontline spending to be in community health services. So, But you're right in that we can budgets can be set and we see the budgets being set this year moving in that direction. But we then need to track the actual spend. Sure. Yeah. And I so that's the bit that, that needs to follow so that the... Um, and, and we are absolutely acutely aware of that. Donald. Yeah, can I return to the, uh... <coughs> the vexed issue of um, care home closures and, and public engagement? Um, and I know Mr Huggins will be aware of several in um, Argyll and Butte, um, where feeling ran so high that actually a petition came to the, first to the petitions committee and then to this committee uh, about it. And the issues are um, ones that we're all... Uh, well aware of. There's um, often a sense that decisions are predetermined. Um, there's a sense that consultation is superficial. Uh, and there's a sense that information is, is lacking. Um, and I think, to be fair to the IJB, they will take lessons on, on board. But there, I think, remains a gap between the, the buzzwords of locality planning and co-production, what's actually happening on the ground, whereas where the fact is there just isn't the public support that we all want um, if these changes are, are right and correct and need to go through. Um, and one of the witnesses gave evidence to this committee and spoke about, I think a, she spoke about real culture change. Um, and my fear is that um, whilst integration will take time, of course, things are moving very slowly. And how do we achieve that culture change uh, that must happen? Um. I'll hand over to Jeff in a second, who's been far closer uh, to this than, than I have and has actually spent a fair bit of time over in our, our Gail and Butte um, meeting uh, those directly involved. And, and I think I think there is something about, even if something that an integrated authority believes what they're putting forward is the right thing, um, it's important that that is explained properly and why, and that time is taken uh, to go out and properly consult, not just say, you know, this is what we're doing, take it or leave it. Um, and more importantly than that, to demonstrate what the new services are going to replace, what is being replaced actually are. And I think that's the bit that, well, to be, to be honest, that, you know, health boards haven't always been as good at doing. So integration authorities need to, to um, look at the best practice in terms of being able to demonstrate what new services will, will look like and feel like for those receiving them. Um, so I think it was right that they've taken more time to look at the, the proposals. Um, clearly, uh, there have been, uh, there, are, there are difficulties in terms of the service provision within the care home sector in that area. Um, Jeff, do you want to say a little bit about your involvement? Yeah, we're, we're talking particularly about some of the services in Campbelltown, aren't we? Uh, and and Deneen as well. But, but, but the Campbelltown one, I think, is, is particularly interesting because what we, what we had there is a care home which has got significant under-occupancy. I think at the time when I was last over talking about it, it had something like 12 or 13 um, places occupied out of about 30. Um, significant um, issues in respect of the um, ability of the home to have appropriate staff. Um, in place, both because of issues in terms of recruiting within the area, but also because of poor ratings that the home had received previously. Uh, and and what, what, we, what we had was a situation where 
probably in other circumstances what would have happened is that the care home would have, the, the care home operators would have simply given notice to quit and indicated that they intended to close the home and then passed the problem to the integration authority to find rehousing for the 12 or 13 people in the area now that was clearly undesirable for all parties in that that would have required those people from Campbelltown to be moved from Campbelltown and to receive care elsewhere. And so the Integration Authority in that, in that space stepped in to have a conversation about how they would find a solution which met better the needs of the people in Campbelltown. Now, that's the point at which things become difficult because the solution there, which was seen initially as the, as the desirable one, was to find 17 more people to go into residential care in Campbelltown to actually occupy that and make it value for money. Now, in the same way that we have a, a, a desire to shift the balance from hospital to community, we have a desire to move, shift the balance from residential to care at home. And, and I, think, I think in that context, the idea that we would simply want to enhance or increase the amount of residential care being offered in an area wasn't particularly desirable. So we have worked through the process with the partnership, and, and some of, but some of the public expectations within that space aren't in the same space as, as the expectations that you said are, are here for the Parliament of more community. There is an expectation of more residential in, the, in, the, in that case that had to be worked through. So we've, we've identified a solution, the, the partnership with the assistance of both the council, um, uh, the council leader and, and the, the local MSP have worked through the process to now identify how to resolve the issues within Campbelltown to find an appropriate solution that meets the needs of people there while also not requiring people to transfer externally. But the change that we had in this was um, rather than simply having a notice to quit, um, what we had was a process which resolved this, albeit with some trickiness, um, in that people had different views, but that's part of the process. So I'm not, I, I don't think effective and constructive engagement will be every time something happens, everybody says, that's great, we're doing it. I, I think there will continue to be the need to work through different views on things, and I think we have to be careful not to identify the working through different views and different perspectives as meaning that engagement's not working, because in the end, engagement has worked there. Well, I, I, I mean, to be fair, I think a temporary, uh, there's been a temporary resolution uh, over the course of a year, but I, I, I was actually more interested in, the, in, in a slightly higher level, which is that this demonstrates to me that engagement has to be meaningful mm. uh, with communities. And in, in these instances, I don't think it has been. And what happens is that the, the, the public hear that their local care home is closing and there's a media campaign, et cetera, and it, and it, and it doesn't work for anyone to be frank. Um, and I just was interested in your, in, in the lessons that have, can be learned from those experiences and, and how we affect this culture change that, that, that we all, I think, accept requires to take place. Probably the, the, the main thing would be earlier engagement when, you know, sometimes things happen, sometimes, you know, a care home or whatever will, will find themselves in difficulty and that can create a whole range of, of knock-on effects and, uh, and triggers. Uh, it's then about trying to have early engagement when, when the, there is a, a foreseeable problem and to do that um, in a way that isn't about dealing with a crisis and actually have the time, because some of these, I mean, this obviously this process has taken time, uh, but it's been important to take that time to try and reach a better solution. So I guess what you know, whether it's the private sector, whether it's the, the public sector or the, the voluntary sector, early discussion about potential issues and problems, I think, is really important to try and do that in a way that's not about responding to a crisis. The, the, the other thing I think which came out of it was um, a move away from seeing the, the, ch the change process as being about individual components of the overall service. And, for, and in, this is the conversation we've been having with our Gallen more generally, is to actually lift it and think a bit more about how services are applied across geographies. Because at the point when we're simply talking about this unit of service or this particular component of the service, people who, you know, the community and the public don't get the full picture of how a range of changes will provide effectively a better or a more cost-effective or a more sustainable or a more deliverable service over time. So I think part of the learning there was about some of the context. So you know, the home that we're talking about was one of two homes within the area. Um, you know, some of the issues also related to how they might be able to employ more people to work in care at home rather than in the residential sector, and also about the quality and nature of training and upskilling in the area. So you had a series of things, all of which weren't, which took the solution from simply being about the one particular property to being a, a decision about the wider about the wider environment. And that's part of the learning that we've taken from our, our, our Gallen Butte and we're, which we're using elsewhere. 
I think it also was about the importance of earlier engagement with elected members and, and with MSPs, um, because to be fair, they are the ones who will tend to, to um, have the impetus to decide to campaign to retain something in that that appears to be something which is, is common across the piece. Um, and and it, it is the challenge to make the case against such campaigns uh, in that situation. Can I just ask one quick follow-up? Do you, and moving to um, changes in, I suppose, medical or clinical care, um, do you think that um, medical professionals should have a greater role in stakeholder engagement? Do you think that's helpful? Uh, I, I think clinical voices are really important in, in explaining um, <clears throat> why sometimes decisions are made. Well, well, let's take decisions that are sometimes made on patient safety grounds. I think the best people to explain that are, are the, the clinical uh, voices. I think, though, when service changes are, are um, proposed, I think clinical voices, not just medical uh, voices, but clinical voices across the piece, uh, are, are imp an important component of that because in explaining how services will be different and actually in many cases will be delivered in a different and better and enhanced way, it's important that that's explained by those who will be delivering the services. So if a service is going to be delivered in the community, for example, through primary care or community health services that had previously been delivered in a different way, it's really important that public assurance is, is given about the quality of that service. And therefore, those delivering the service are quite often the most powerful voices at explaining what it will look and feel like. And I think we don't always um, utilise those voices in a way that I, th I think we, we could. Um, and I think it's important that th those voices are heard al along with others. This is where I think some of the um, problems arise with the realistic medicine agenda, because I think some people in the community might be willing to put up with a lesser service that is local rather than a centralised service that in the eyes of clinicians is better. And I think that is that is equally, from the, the public's point of view and the patient's point of view, realistic medicine as well. And I think that's part of the dilemma of this agenda that's been put forward. Inevitably, those tensions will, will always be there. And I guess um, it depends. I mean, I would always, I would argue quite, uh, I would argue strongly that uh, often the, the, the services that are being developed um, will be of better quality. Um, and that's that should always be the, the, the driving force. And again, it depends on what kind of service we're talking about. If it's a once in a lifetime thing, uh, that someone will receive, or once or twice in a lifetime procedure, for example, then I think you know the arguments are different from something that someone will want to receive on a weekly basis. That you would you would see the uh, the, the difficulties in someone having to travel uh, further for that. So, and actually, I think what realistic medicine says, alongside the um, the national clinical strategy, is actually we've got the opportunity to deliver a lot of services more locally if we get that right. So a lot of services being delivered uh, within uh, primary care, uh, within community health services, uh, in, a, in a way that avoids people perhaps having to travel to the hospital. If you look at diabetic care, for example, a very good example um, that a lot more of that is now delivered within local community health services that people previously had to travel to hospital to receive. So it is a two-way process, but we need to explain uh, the rationale and what the service looks like far better than, than we do at the moment. We also have uh, a number of questions on the budget issues, so um, I think we'll move on to that if, if everybody's okay with that. Yeah, uh, 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 Colin. Much convener. Um, good morning to the, the panel. When a local authority sets its budget, they obviously um, they, they set a balanced budget effectively by a certain date, uh, and they, they identify specifically where the savings are going to come for the year ahead. Um, obviously, a large part of what was previously council budgets are now part of IGBs. A number of IGBs still haven't set a budget for the year ahead, and a number have set budgets with savings targets with no detail whatsoever as to how they're actually going to meet those savings targets. Do you think that's a satisfactory position? And why do you think IGBs are having difficulty identifying their savings if these are simply efficiency savings? So. Um, just to reiterate, the, the, we are talking about a total of 8.2 billion of resources at the disposal uh, 
of the integration authorities. And I think sometimes it's important to focus on the the the, the, the pot of money that is to to be spent rather than just the uh, efficiency uh, savings that that require to be made. Um, in terms of the the budget setting process, uh, a couple of things. It is a lot better, and a lot of progress has been made on last year in terms of time frames and the number of uh, budgets that have been uh, successfully uh, set. There remains um, uh, some uh, issues, so the, the six partnerships within uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, for example, uh, there uh, remains a, a legacy issue of, I think, uh, 7.8 million of non-recurring funding uh, to be resolved uh, from 2016-17. Uh, now, that's to put that in some context, I think those authorities have about two billion yep. to spend between them. So, you know, 7.8 million, uh, two billion, it re remains an issue, but it is an issue that is being resolved, and they're very, very positive discussions and I'm confident that those discussions will, uh, um, uh, with support from the Scottish Government, is going to deliver a uh, resolution uh, to that um, uh, very, very soon indeed. Um, and the only other one is the, the Fife Partnership, where there are issues around the set-aside budget, which again are, are being worked through uh, and I'm confident will be resolved. Um, that is a significant improvement from 2016-17, when 11 of the 31 IJBs had agreed a budget by the end of April. We're now in a position where uh, all have bar the, the seven. Uh, and uh, those those seven are working through uh, the, the issues that they have to work through. In terms of efficiency savings, uh, we um, all of uh, the public sector as a whole uh, is uh, is used to um, and have for many years, whether it's local authorities or indeed health boards, have um, have delivered efficiency savings. Uh, the level of efficiency savings we're asking integrated authorities to deliver is around 3.5%. Um, and uh, again, we would expect them to be using uh, the opportunity to reform, to deliver service changes in terms of shifting the balance of care, in terms of how they prioritise and resource uh, services that are going to shift that balance, keep people at a hospital, reduce um, unscheduled care admissions to hospital and the plans that, uh, that integrated authorities are, are uh, developing, we are confident will we'll deliver that direction of travel. Cabinet Secretary didn't make any reference to those IGBs that have set budgets that have savings targets but no detail whatsoever as to how they're going to meet at least part of those savings targets have simply got figures in their budget. So why are those IGBs not able to identify those savings having set a budget if these are simply efficiency savings? Well, the savings that, that uh, integrated authorities will be delivering, some of those will be in year savings and they'll be working through those uh, savings as they, as they progress. But, you know, um, Christine is closer to the, the finance officers who are working uh, through those budgets uh, and she can say something about that. But, you know, we, we, we don't have, we're confident that the integration authorities will uh, deliver those savings, some of which will be in year savings. Do you want to yeah, I think it's probably partly the factor that they, certainly in the NHS, don't treat the years as entirely standalone. So it's a rolling programme of savings. And if you look at the history over the last, even the last three or four years, there is always a component of savings that are, are, are one-off savings, as well as, you know, as you refer to efficiency savings when you're making a, a change to a service and that's something that you'll have on a on a recurring basis um, and typically that, that has run at um, you know anything from a, a quarter uh, on average about a quarter of the or to a third of the, the total savings so so that situation is not a new one um, if you look at that history then boards have been able to in, in the NHS to achieve those savings in year but it is a nature of the way in which services are and budgets are defined that, that there can be swings um, on areas that are um, pressures in year and areas where the actual expenditure is, is an improved position on the budgets that you set, given that you know, the budgets are a, a target that you set at the beginning of the year. So I think it's just important to see it in that context. I don't think there's any integration authority that has a position where they have absolutely no plans to, to back up those um, savings that they've got in place, but they, to, to not have everything 
completely and fully identified at the beginning of the year is not an uncommon situation and isn't of itself an indicator that there won't be balance, but it does mean that there's more work to be done in year to identify those, and that's what, where we focus our efforts, is to understand the extent to which there's a level of risk with those unidentified savings, um, and also to work hard on looking at where there are national things or regional um, actions that can be taken beyond the boundaries of an individual integration authority or, or an NHS board or a local authority. Okay, can we look then at the actual process that IGBs follow when, when budgets are set? I mean, the theory behind the budget setting process is that IGBs agree a strategic plan and effectively identify what resources are required to meet that plan and, uh, and align resources to outcomes. But what you actually get in practical terms is that local authorities decide how much they're going to give to the IGB. Health boards then decide how much they're going to give to the IGB. And then the IGB simply take that money and decide what they're going to spend that money on. Now, do you think that's a satisfactory process? Um, and, and how would you improve that process? The process has certainly improved over the last year. If you look at some of the issues that were being raised um, in terms of the budget setting process last year, I think a lot of work through guidance, and Christine has worked very closely with finance officers um, to um, to get um, the, the budget setting process more into the, the former than, than the latter uh, so there's, there's definitely more evidence of integration authorities really through the chief officers and chief finance officers being more engaged with the NHS boards and the local authorities as part of that budget setting process. I think what I would say in this financial year is that because we set that clear direction at the beginning about the need to maintain spend, it took away a lot of that negotiation that was there in the first year. So I think that's why it feels like that's been one of the most positively received steps in the 17-18 budget and the development of it, um, because there isn't then that negotiation of taking off an efficiency saving before you hand over um, a budget to the Integration Authority. We were, we were very clearly saying that we expect um, in, in cash terms as a minimum spend to be the same as it was in 16-17. In so my, my view would be that that took away a lot of that, um, of what you saw in those in that first year, but Jeff, I think maybe wanted to come in. Yeah. I, I suppose the other thing which we're seeing is some of the interdependencies between integration authorities and the residual NHS services. So if the expectation in 17-18 is a reduction in unscheduled care, which is clearly sig signalled in the delivery plan, then um, decisions by the integration authority, we wouldn't want them to take them um, without proper and full discussion with the residual health board. Um, on the basis that simply saying to you know, the chief executive of NHS Lothian, by the way, we're going to give you 20% less this year. Um, can you just get on and sort that out? Um, and we're not going to quite tell you how we're going to manage your demand for you. So we're seeing they're having to actually work through some of the complexities of the interdependencies because the decisions that are made by the integration authority then have implications for the NHS boards in respect of their other services in terms of the composition of what goes on within a hospital, but also just having confidence that if there is an intention to reduce attendances or admissions, that that can actually be sustained across the year. So, so that's meant having resolved all of those year issues in advance of the start of the financial year is probably beyond either boards or integration authorities, and it's more of a continuing conversation as to how they resolve those issues uh, through the year. So I, th I think it's, it's, imp it's important to see it in that way. I think we're also still working through the process of moving beyond simply seeing resources as continuing to be earmarked um, on the basis of their historical source or what they were previously allocated for. You know, I think we had this conversation last time. Uh, we were here about the, you know, the expectations from different interests that money that we used to be spent on, you know, pharmacy continues to be spent on pharmacy. And I, I think we're seeing, as part of the process of change, um, conversations which go beyond simply an efficiency, which is doing something faster or cheaper, to actually deciding what you might do less of or where you can take failure demand out of the system. And so I, I think, again, you're also seeing different styles of solution um, going, in, going into the process. And I, I think where we are this year in respect of efficiencies isn't that different to where we were last year. Um, a problem, you know, yeah. uh, and but the consequence of that was during last year the efficiencies were delivered. Um, you know, we reached the end of the year uh, on the you know, in the financial state in the integration landscape that we wanted we wanted to do so. So it shows that rather than artificially pretending that you can resolve all those issues before the year starts, resolving some and then to continue to work through the others has been quite an effective methodology. Well, I think it's fair to say that 
a lot of it's non-recurring um, in terms of these savings made very late in the day. But can I come back to it? In what way do you see improvements being made? For example, one of the, the, the issues raised was, well, it's OK to put in a figure for savings without identifying where it is because it, it, you know, you're know you doing it on an annual basis. Why are we not in a position where we're allowing IGBs, local authorities, to have three-year budgets? With the government setting a three-year budget so they, they have the certainty that they can set out a budget over a longer period of time, why are we not moving in that particular direction? And how, how else do you, you see the budget process improving? You talk about giving, them, giving IGBs um, some more certainty by effectively defining how much local authorities can cut the budget allocation to and, and where the £107 million, pounds, for example, goes to. Does that mean you see more central direction coming to, 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 towards IGBs and how they set their budgets? I mean, I think on the, the three-year um, budget setting, I mean, th these are obviously um, discussions that we'll, we'll continue to have and <clears throat> about how we can give more kind of longer-term certainty. I, I guess, to be blunt, so the, the, there has there have been challenges because of the whole uh, Scottish budget setting process was, um, was quite uh, late um, for all the reasons that we, we understand in terms of... Um, of the Scottish Government uh, understanding its uh, its budget from the UK Government and so on and so forth in terms of the knock-on consequences of of the, of the Scottish Government's uh, budget set and time frame that has a knock-on effect to to those receiving uh, resources. So, uh, but you you make no, not an unreasonable point um, about you know, looking um, to a longer-term time frame. That's something we would we would want to do, uh, and something that we're certainly continuing to discuss with yeah. with partners. So we are we are moving to to the uh, a longer time period, and I think the, the part of the um, guidance is to move to the. A, a rolling um, three-year cycle with integration authorities, which is not dissimilar to the NHS. So, and, and, and similar with local authorities, although you set a rolling budget for a longer period of time, it's always the first year that is your um, your real target budget, and, and then you would expect to refine years two and three as you go. So that, that's absolutely the direction that we're headed in. Um, part part of that that um, balance needs to be to the extent to which there can be clear assumptions from. Uh, Scottish Government about the, the, the high level funding that's available. Um, the way that we do that with the NHS is that we we a, a, agree on a reasonable set of assumptions that the NHS works to. So I don't think it's unreasonable to have a rolling, uh, a three year rolling budget for integration authorities. But I think we all need to recognise that, that there will be um, changes to certainly years two and three as you take that, that kind of process forward. But I think the more that we see of that, the better. For everybody, and the other thing I would say to you is that we, um, I, I think, have good working relationships with the integration authorities, not just the chief finance officers, but um, we, we we take feedback from them, and and you know it's in our gift to, to do things like be give more direction or less direction where it's helpful to do so. So I would like to hear back from the integration authorities about the things that they feel are obstacles to um, good longer term planning and areas that they see it could improve and we'll, and we'll take that on board as we, we develop the um, the budget for 18-19 for but there are, there are, there's nothing that is really really significant that's been raised with me other than the extent to which you can give greater certainty about funding from, from Scottish Government but we'll continue to work on reasonable assumptions with integration authorities as we go through that. Final, final point, the Cabinet Secretary won't be surprised, I'm going to touch on uh, the issue of the, the living wage. Um, are we yet in a position where people who carry out sleepover shifts are being paid the real living wage or are IGB's local authorities simply adhering to the HMRC guidance on the national living wage? So the commitment we've given is that during this financial year in 17-18, the sleepover rates will be paid at the real living wage. But work is ongoing, as I'm sure you're aware of, around some of the complexities of that with service providers. We've got, you know, the, the, some of the service providers have, have made the point that you know we need to uh, take time to enable them to, uh, in some circumstances, actually make quite quite fundamental changes to the way services are delivered and they were concerned about um, services potentially falling over um, if that time wasn't taken and that's why ourselves with COSLA and the service providers have taken a, 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 a 
a sort of cautious approach and a planned approach to making sure that delivering that living wage for sleepovers, as it will be delivered during 1718, is done in a planned, careful way that didn't actually impact on not just the service providers, but more importantly, the service users who are relying on those services. Jeff, do you want to add in? Yeah, a, a, a few things. So I, I suppose the, the work that we've done both around living wage and around sleepovers has revealed a lot about what's going on within the system that we hadn't perhaps been aware of before, um, both both in terms of the structure and the differentials that apply between different different areas a across the country. Um, first, first of all, I think we hadn't been entirely aware of how many people were subject to sleepovers and also the structure of the care packages that they've had. And so some of the work that we've been doing with partners, with um, um, with chief officers and others is to actually look at whether the service models in some places are actually the best service models. So whether sleepers are being used inappropriately or in ways which could be, um, they could deliver a better quality of service. So we've got a, a change program around that, looking at appropriate service <coughs> models, thinking about the use of technology, but also ensuring that people for whom sleepovers is the appropriate thing get that in a, a quality way. The, 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 as we've then worked through the process of what the implications are to pay at the £8.45 uh, level, what we then see is questions coming back to us which are, um, we're, we think that we're going to find it more difficult to recruit people to do waking hours if we're prepared to pay people £8.45 to effectively be available on a sleepover basis. And so questions about issues around recruitment come out of that. So we're again having to work through how we understand these challenges with providers as well, because at each point where we think we've resolved something, something else develops as a, as a challenge within it. So we, we'll, we'll continue to, to do the work. We've said that we'll come back to um, with outcomes of, of that work later in the year, but we, you know, we will look to find a result that meets the needs both of, meets the commitment, but also meets the needs of provider organisations, meets the needs of people, but also works within the integrated landscape and the wider social care reform and we process. And resources aside for this and have left the door open for additional resources if those resources are shown to, to not be adequate to meet the commitment that's been made. So those discussions are, are ongoing also. But I'm presuming the £10 million pounds allocated realistically won't be sufficient to pay the real living wage. Well, that work is ongoing. Um, what we've said is if it's not, then more resources will be made available. Um, and, uh, you know, part of the work that Jeff has described is the financial costing around that as well. Um, the £10 million pounds was a, a, a starting point based on some assumptions. Uh, as Jeff said, the complexity of it is more work is is done uh, around this issue, um, you know, shows that it will, will guide whether those assumptions were, were accurate or, or not accurate, but the door has been left open for additional resources should those be required. I, I think that was you know, part of the reason for the structure of the arrangement for 17-18 was when we tried to un unpick the data to identify what the marginal cost was, it became quite complex, both because of some of the an initial work that had gone into meeting HMRC, um, but also because of um, different expectations about the structure of service, but also simply being able to cost and evaluate the difference between what was previously like almost you know, single payment packages of maybe 35 or 40 pounds for a night and converting that into an hourly rate. So we, we came into this year with the, dod with the, the data looking distinctly fragile in terms of our ability to say it will cost that to deliver the 1617 service at, in 1718 at 8.45 an hour for sleepovers but we've just got so many moving parts in that that, that actually assessing the full cost um, is quite difficult it, in practical terms it could be that the amount that's been allocated for 1718 is sufficient but then 1819 would be different right, absolutely so. when that is achieved when we have that can you write to the committee and advise us of that that would be helpful anybody else like to come in Miles. Rick, um, a small point. With children's services not being part of IJBs, what work's going on potentially to include that in the future? And what impact potentially is there around these pressures we're hearing with adult services on potentially um, children's services? Some uh, IGBs do cover children's services, so I think it's about a third. It's about a third. N uh, nearly all integration authorities have got children's health services, right. largely because they're largely provided through primary care, and a third have got um, mm -hmm. social care services as well. So it's a mixed picture yeah. rather than a single picture. And for those. Uh, 
And I think what we would want to to do is to to work with um, the integration authorities and and certainly within the ministerial strategic group to look at what the 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 benefits or or downside and benefits, I guess, of of including children's services have been. So if there are advantages that are clearly demonstrated of including children's services, then I think we would want to evidence that and to look at what lessons that might uh, show for those who currently don't. Um, so uh, I think you know, we of? have not, we've not mandated it as, um, but it is something that we would want to continue to work to look at the, the relative benefits of including children's services. What sort of timetable are we talking then for around that? Well, the analysis is ongoing. I think we'll see from the reports, that, the annual reports that the uh, integrated authorities are uh, are going to be submitting in the autumn. Those that have children's services within them, it will be, uh, I think we'll do some analysis of, of what the benefits of that are, are demonstrating. And we would want to we'll probably do that through the MSG, I would think. A, a, a couple of things. You, you asked particularly about financial pressures, and I, I think what's instructive is that those areas which do have children's services in have seen probably additional financial pressures on the children's side, which have then squeezed the services for adults and elderly. So if, if we're thinking about learning disability and, and autism and a, a number of the integration authorities that are children's services have had to find additional resource from elsewhere in the budget to support the children's services. So I, th I think you've got to um, see this as being a, you know, a, a set of issues that flow both ways. The, the conversation, and we actually had a conversation um, yesterday between, uh, between officials about the integration of children's services, it is complex because in many areas, while people are generally in favour of integration, many areas are thinking about integration between children's services and, ed and education, mm -hmm. as opposed to between sure. integration of children's services and health. And so you know, there's, a, there's a question there as to whether you know, either the parliament or the government <coughs> wants to mandate a template or whether it wants to allow for continued um, local decision as to how they best want to structure, but with a general commitment to uh, working across boundaries, whether those are service level boundaries or geographical boundaries, to get better value and to get more effective. So we're seeing a number of dynamics in there, and it's very seductive for us just to see it from our perspective in health, but you, you know, because other people are looking at this question from a completely different sure. lens. Thank you. Okay, um, on the 30th, uh, of May, we had a discussion about the distinction between efficiency savings and cuts, and uh, Mr McLaughlin will recall the exchange we had previously on that. Um, in that session, Keith Redpath, Western Battenshire, said there may be some aspects of efficiency and doing things a bit better that mitigate some of that, but the reality is most people would recognise him as potential cut to the level of service. That's why I use the term cuts. Katie Lewis of uh, Dumfries said there would be some things that we do you might want to describe as cuts or budget reductions. And uh, Carl Williamson of Shetland said, as budgets keep getting reduced, we might get to the position where we need to make cuts and reduce services. Um, we have discussed the thesaurus used by chief officers in Scotland, which some say cuts, some say efficiencies, some say savings. Um, do you now recognise from those chief officers that there are cuts being made? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm asking Ms McLaughlin first of all. Um, so the overall budget is, is increasing and not reducing, so I don't think there, 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 there are not cuts overall to health and social care, and, and I think that's a point that's, that we've been trying to make. Do you so recognise what has been said by chief officers who are on the ground operating budgets that they are having to make what they call cuts in their services? So they're having to move money around the, the, the system and the money has to go farther than, than it has before. And you, that's, cannot that's bring what yourself, I you cannot bring yourself to say that there are cuts in services. I think I've tried to answer your question no, as transparently as I, as I, as I, I can. Mean, I you know, if all budgets stay the same in every line, then there'll be no change. So, you know, change is required and that will mean... No one's arguing about change. No one's mm -hmm. arguing about change. So what we're arguing about people is being up front with the committee. Mm -hmm. And we have senior officers telling us that on the ground there are cuts being made. Now there seems to be a gulf between what they're saying on the ground in our communities and what people, our constituents are seeing day in, day out, and what people at government level and senior civil servants are willing to accept. Why can we not just accept that this is going on in our communities? Well, because it isn't as 
black and white as that because some it, budgets are increasing and some services are having more money spent on them. So if you look at primary and community health services, more money is going to be spent in primary care. But there might be other services where there's less money. As I say, if all budgets stay the same and there's no shift of money, then you'll not see the shift in the balance of care. So by by definition, there will be some budgets that will be uh, reduced and some budgets that will increase. And efficiency savings are, are, uh, um, are used in a way to drive that change by ensuring that the resources that are freed up can be invested in areas that are, are priority areas, because otherwise nothing will change. These are not efficiency savings. They are telling us their cuts to services. Well, some services will be reduced and some funding for services will be reduced, but other services will have increases so in some funding. some services will be cut. Yeah. Well, if we're going to change services uh, and put more money into some services as per the whole discussion we've just had for the last hour and a half, and everybody has agreed that is a good thing, then clearly other things will have to change and be reduced. You can't spend the same amount of money on everything nope. and, not pr and therefore that priority prioritises nothing. So some things will have to change and have less money spent on them in order to spend more money on other things. And therefore, the, the priorities in community health services, in primary care, will see more money being spent on them, but other areas will see less money being spent on them. And that will have an impact on people, on patients, on people who use the services on the ground. Well, people will see their services delivered in a different way, so less people having to go to hospital because more money is being spent in primary and community services. I think that's a good thing, having people going to hospital less because they're having their services in the community, I think is a better service for patients, and clearly that is why the direction of travel is in that, that way, because we want to make services better, not worse, but that requires us to keep people out of hospital, to keep people in the community, in their own home for as long as possible and the people will receive their services in a different way i think it'll be better though i don't i don't agree that that'll be a detrimental service of course time will tell whether that is better well, of course not. anyone else got any final points you wish to make no. okay uh, thank you very much for your attendance this morning and we'll suspend briefly just to change the panel
Uh, agenda item 13 is NHS governance. The, uh, this is the 13th item on our agenda today, and um, we're going to look at whistleblowing. Can I welcome to the committee Sir Robert Francis QC, uh, Cathy James, Chief Executive, Public Concern at Work, Kirsty Lees Campbell, Senior Manager of Strategy and Insight, City of Edinburgh Council, uh, Laura Callender, uh, Governance Compliance Manager, City of Edinburgh Council, uh, Robert Creelman, Non-Executive Director NHS Highland and Morag Brown, Non-Executive Director and Co-Chair of Staff Governance Committee and Whistleblowing Champion NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. I think you'll need a big business card to get all that on it. <laughs> Um, we're going to move to questions. We've got around an hour, um, uh, so could I please appeal to people to be short um, with your questions and answers. Um, could, I, could I begin myself by just asking if you think the um, system we have in Scotland in relation to whistleblowing is fit for purpose? Who would like to start us off? And sorry, I meant to say not everyone needs to answer every question. Yes, Here, Robert. To kick off, Go for it. It, Robin is actually... Sorry, Robin. The, sorry. It's not fully developed yet. It's not fully in place yet. And I think to judge it in isolation judges it wrongly. To me, it's a, it's a, whistleblowing is basically a lifeboat for the culture of the NHS. If the rest of your culture is in place, you should seldom require the lifeboat, but you must have the lifeboat. So yeah, I'm comfortable with where we are in NHS Highland. We're still refining the system, making changes to it. But generally, I'm comfortable with the direction of travel, and I think it is very worthwhile. Anyone else like to comment at this point? I mean, I, 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 I would agree that it's a, a, a journey that the NHS is going on, both in England and in Scotland in the sense that a lot of the needed necessary parts are being put in place, but some of the progress is quite slow. So, for example, the national officer role is not in place yet, but it's coming, and there's thought around the structure of that. So putting in some, some statutory footing for that role is in stark contrast to what's going on in England, where the role's been put in place as a kind of test to see what best practice looks like but that, that has its own problems. So the slower progression is because there's planning around it. Um, but I think, you know, work on whistleblowing will never be uh, a finished job. It's something that is always going to need adaptation and uh, review and, and, and consideration. And that's why having a national role responsible for it is vitally important because otherwise it, get lo it get, gets lost in all the other requirements um, that are put uh, on local organisations. Yeah. Robin, you mentioned the, the lifeboat. Um, certainly my experience of dealing with constituents have come to me is that as some of them try to clamber aboard that lifeboat, they're booted back into the water. Um, do you recognise that? I recognise that every system potentially can fail, but I think we have to, to start from a position of recognising the differences between the systems in Scotland and England Whistleblowing in Scotland really took off after the first Ayrshire and Arden about four years ago or so, very roughly speaking, where learning hadn't been shared and there was a lack of transparency in the system. As a result of that, Healthcare Improvement Scotland introduced the Adverse Events Programme, which is a national standardised system of dealing with adverse events. That filled a huge gap in the system and it greatly affected the culture. As a non-executive in Highland, I was very comfortable after that programme came in to see a rise in adverse events because it, to me it demonstrated a more transparent, open culture where people were less afraid to speak up. So I think that, you know, and we have other things like coming in next year, like duty of candour, being open, all these things contribute to the culture of the organisation as, say, the whistleblowing is the lifeboat. So, yes, I recognise that, that some people... I think there's also confusion initially about difference between things that can be just grievances and things that are really whistleblowing. And in relation to adverse events within your organisation, what would be the consequence of adverse events not not being investigated? Because 
the case that the, or a number of cases actually but the, the, the one case in particular that I have is where serious adverse events were reported and yet there was a culture of cover up of not investigating those adverse events and the person who reported them was absolutely hung out to dry well you know that, that's the, the the perfect storm the disaster scenario I can't you know I, I'm very hesitant to say, because I think Midstaff's got to where it got because nobody thought it could happen. So I, I will never say it can't happen in our system, but I would be absolutely astonished. It's the, the people who, adverse events usually initially come through a clinical governance and it is then a, a convention of, of about four, depends on the size of the thing, four or five different experts are involved. It's very difficult to hush up something like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Maura. Yeah, I'd just like to say that in terms of the, you know, the question you raised about people who have whistleblowing's lived experience um, having been harmful or, 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 or damaging, and I think we do need to, to recognise that, as Cathy said, um, that we are at an early stage and we are in a journey. We will seek to improve um, in our arrangements and significantly in our support to staff. I think the national officer role could be of great assistance in that. But I do think we, we need to recognise that people are concerned about being subject of uh, victimisation. They're also concerned that something's done about that. And I think we have to work hard over the next uh, period to, to earn that, that trust of staff and public confidence. So a final point for me. Um, in relation to the process, then, my understanding is that if someone blows the whistle, often the issue is then reported, that goes to the board that they work for and can often find its way to the manager that they may, may be blowing the whistle about. Is that, um, is that the experience or is, does that not happen? Because clearly someone within the organisation from which they work has to investigate that, um, that, that whistleblowing. It's the, the process is defined in the whistleblowing policy. And there's a range of options in the policy for the staff member. The policies are based on the, the code of practice produced by the Whistleblowing Commission, which is public concern at work. The initial point of contact can be the line manager, or it can be a manager in a different place, or it could be a variety of people. So it's not, obviously, if there are if it had to be done through line management, then the, the, the process would be devalued. Yes, sorry, Kirsty. Um, I just want to be helpful. We have a unique arrangement in the City of Edinburgh Council around the governance of whistleblowing disclosures, just picking up on that point. Um, we have an independent hotline provider who oversees the disclosures and reports that come in through whistleblowing, and they report directly to our scrutiny committee. So in terms of ensuring that the whistleblowing report or disclosure is taken seriously, that the investigation is carried out in full, that's our kind of check and balance to ensure that that comes into play. Okay, thank you. Alex? Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> Two weeks ago, when we first discussed this topic in committee, um, there was a, a heated discussion about the difference or the spectrum between raising concerns and whistleblowing, and that there was a view that, uh, in, in the majority of cases, that most NHS staff felt empowered to, quote-unquote, raise concerns, but whistleblowing feels like a, a different threshold, a different bar to be met. Um, and I just wondered if we could have the reflections of the panel on that spectrum and at what point they think it becomes harder for staff to actually direct criticism and perhaps against a colleague or a set of practices um, over and above the sort of normal day-to-day, -day, this doesn't feel right, maybe we should do this differently kind of uh, uh, intervention. Um, well, if, if I can speak from... Uh um, my, my, my overall experience, uh, as you may know, that I, I'm very keen to try and get away from the term whistleblowing because it covers a huge range of things, some of which not everybody, even well-meaning people, think is appropriate, and it implies uh, a, a barrier to speaking up. Um, so in, a, in the ideal world, everything should be a matter of speaking up 
being listened to, seeing action being taken. Unfortunately, we know that's not the position. I think to have a, an artificial... I think any division between what you would call just speaking up and whistleblowing is likely to be counterproductive. Um, what we should be looking at, it seems to me, is what is the reaction to someone who speaks up? Is it, at one end of the spectrum, victimisation, no action, nothing done? At the other end, the positive end, is a welcoming of the issue, an investigation of the issue, an action taken, and then, as it were, a thank you to the person who raised the, raised the concern. And if you are at one end of the spectrum, then clearly alarm bells should be ringing about the nature of the culture in a particular organisation. So that would be my general answer. There is, of course, a spectrum, but um, it is all speaking up. Some people become victims of speaking up. Others become the champions of what it is that they sp have spoken up about. I would, the terminology is really crucial with this, um, and there is a lot of confusion. But I think the danger with getting rid of the term altogether because it's fraught with difficulty is that you end up endlessly entrenching that negative view about it. So, you know, we're, you know we weren't called the whistleblowing charity when we were set up 25 years ago. We had, we're called Public Concern at Work because of that sense that to be a whistleblower is to take a risk. So my view is I don't, I don't have a view on what it should be called as a process, but it's a process from the internal to a kind of escalation process within the organisation that's very clearly set out and people are trained about it. And that's starting to change the training piece around whistleblowing is really, really gaining momentum, both in the health sector and in financial services, interestingly. The two sectors where there have been huge scandals are starting to get uh, some momentum around this issue. But if we... Uh, and the external, because, of course, sometimes it's the external that's seen to be the whistleblowing, and everything we do internally is soft and fluffy and works. But that's not the reality from our advice line. Most whistleblowers try once or twice internally, then they give up. So, you know, if we want to see this as something that is in the interest of the NHS in Scotland to know about where the problems are, then we need to, we need to um, capture those people, listen to them, act on the concerns and make sure they're protected. OK. I don't think the terminology matters that much, to be honest. If I give a fairly simple example, if you're in a, a clinical setting and someone doesn't wash their hands, you know, one of the nurses or doctors doesn't wash their hands, another member staff sees this. The normal process would be for them to record on a system known as Datex, which then goes to clinical governance within the health board, and it's acted upon. But if that person does that and nothing happens, and the offender still doesn't wash their hands day after day, week after week, then there needs to be an outlet to raise the profile of that, which is currently whistleblowing. So, if I may convene it, so Robert um, talked about those kind of two ends of the spectrum where there's a, a concern that somebody who wanted to blow the whistle um, might end up being victimised to the other end of the spectrum where they're thanked at the end of the process and things improve and, and the rest of it. It also struck me that towards the, the sort of more negative end of the spectrum, there's also this idea, I think, that we all have examples of, um, not just in the NHS, but in, in other walks of life as well, that um, upward complaint might be met with either disbelief or an inaction. So if you've got these two things, these two barriers to uh, actually taking action and, and putting your head above the parapet as it were and blowing the whistle, i.e. the concern of being victimised, which we know does happen, and also the, the sort of um, cynicism that you'll be believed or even listened to in that regard, how does the panel believe that we can mitigate those very significant barriers and what do we have in place right now and what do you think we could have in place that we don't currently? If I could just start from a general perspective, um, I, I believe, and perhaps it, as I'm a lawyer, you might think I would believe, that if someone raises an issue which is disputed, you must have a process which sorts out the facts. So, so often with um, people who speak up, what happens is that it all become, descends immediately to the personal. Who's to blame for what has been raised? If there isn't anyone, it must be the fault of the person who's raised the issue. We have to get used to the idea that, that there will be disagreement about what's right and wrong, but we need then to sort out what is right in an authoritative and fair and proportionate manner. And until you do that, you're never going to proceed 
very far in, in actually either improving the service <coughs> or, or in um, looking after the person who's raised a no doubt genuine concern. I think we have to recognise that not everything staff raise will turn out to be correct, but they mustn't be discouraged from raising it. And if it is thought they're not correct, then they sh a proper explanation should be given to them, which is, makes sense to everyone as to, uh, as to why um, there, there's a difference of view about it. So that's the process? Well, so the you process is invest you have to have yeah. a process of authoritative investigation. What it is it must depend on the facts, obviously, but a process of authoritative investigation, yeah. and if it's a potentially serious matter, by people who have the authority to investigate and who are trained to do it. I'm afraid so often what happen happens is that things are looked into in an entirely impressionistic way. Uh, yeah. And when that happens, and there is no action which satisfies the person who's raised the concern, that's when you begin to get the trouble. And the longer you leave that sore, in, in, uncured, as it were, uh, the more likely you are to have victimisation uh, and perhaps even, if not more importantly, a failure to correct the issue that was raised in the first place. So I, I absolutely agree with that. My concern, I suppose, is a, a little bit further upstream and to, to coin the old adage, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And, and my concern is those people who don't even get to the races in terms of actually getting into the process because they're, the culture around them prevents them having the confidence or even intervenes to stop them uh, making a complaint or raising something. Uh, okay. that uh, considering addressing that is, is by ensuring that you have mechanisms where you collect the data about what staff feel about things. The, mm -hmm. um, the NHS staff survey, I think, is becoming a very instructive tool in relation to staff telling the system, we don't believe we will be treated fairly if we, uh, if we raise a concern. Um, we're not listened to with matters of that nature. And that, those figures can be looked at on a quite individual organisational basis. Uh, and we need to get out of a culture in which 51% um, uh, is thought to be a good result. And, and just one more, if I may. I mean, I, I absolutely agree. Um, my concern is that, that those numbers are what's prompted us to take yeah. this on as a committee. So we can measure it, but I'm not convinced that we're actively doing something about it. That, that I think, is my... Did anyone invest in just comment briefly on that point, on any of the points Alex has raised, sorry? Just um, from our experience, we introduced our whistleblowing arrangements in 2014, and the point about culture I think is absolutely critical. Over that period of time, we've built a position where people feel they can contact our whistleblowing hotline and our whistleblowing service, be heard, be listened to, and if the concern is not a matter of whistleblowing within the policy or legislation, the matter is still investigated and the person's given feedback in a proactive, positive way, same manner for those who make a disclosure, whether it's anonymously or not. And I think building confidence through the good process that you put in place allows colleagues and staff to feel that their views are being heard more appropriately. Thank you. Uh, Alison. Oh, sorry, sorry, more I go come to first. Just to say that you'd asked in terms of what we were doing about it, and I think the point culture is very important, and the staff governance uh, committee, which I uh, co-chair, we've uh, recently established a, a subgroup to look at culture because we wanted to address some of those issues and those concerns and the, the feedbacks from surveys uh, and other areas. And I think we are uh, certainly committed to if you like, reshape and refocus our, our culture uh, and to have as one of our core principles that it's a good place, a good and safe place to work. And I think that's that's really important. We're certainly uh, developing a plan to, to look at what our new model or approach would be uh, in respect of culture and also to learn lessons from where it's worked well because I think that's, that's important. And uh, we'll be looking at places like Salford NHS Foundation Trust, which have... Um, seen some significant improvements in, in cultural change. In relation to whistleblowing, yes, we've taken forward a range of um, information sharing and encouragement through, if you like, uh, through staff news, through inserts and in page slips. And for the future, we, we do want to look at extending that through roadshows and further chairing. But a couple of measures that I think are well worth exploring are uh, how we share good practice, how we share the good news where people have reported. Uh, 
concerns and we have acted on them and I think that's that's important and certainly we've had two examples of good practice um, from my review of our whistleblowing cases this year that we're looking at how we can we can best best share and I, and I think in, a, in addition to that I think we need to give some consideration to uh, systems and processes that are quite open uh, uh, and helpful for staff support and whether a buddy system would be helpful for, for people or that they have a supporter um, because of the impact on the, the individual of taking a very serious concern through whistleblowing. So I think there are a number of areas that we are, are looking at, but also ones for the future that we can take forward. Sorry. I think, I think the answer is there's a lot of work to be done to review internally. It isn't enough just to look at the numbers because the numbers won't be comparable across organisations. An organisation that has a very high reporting culture may well not have much end game whistleblowing. An organisation that has no reports should be questioning why they have really low numbers, or it might be that actually they've got the balance about right. So you need to look at the survey work, the, um, the kind of what's happening in other incident reporting processes, speak to staff about it, have focus groups. And I think all too often there's quite a lot of resource involved in that. And again, when pressures are on the NHS to deal with all sorts of other priorities, this can sometimes come to the bottom be at the bottom of the pile but it's where you're going to find out where the problems are so it really needs <coughs> to be given priority okay One Alison, thing, Alison, you sorry you need to be very very quick <laughs> okay in terms of governance as soon as a whistleblowing incident occurs i get notified of that i get a monthly statement of where we are progress who the investigating officer is outcomes eventually good practice learned how it's shared thank you uh, Alison. Thank you very much. Uh, Sir Robert Francis, your Freedom to Speak Up review referred to an NHS England staff survey um, in 2013, which showed that only 72% of respondents were confident that it was safe to raise a concern. And we had a, a lower figure here in Scotland. Do you think that things have improved? Would you expect that result to be better now um, with the National Confidential Alert Line? You're, you're testing my memory as to what the staff survey result was in March this year. I, I don't think it's much better, frankly, uh, and it's, it, we're still at an early stage in the in, in, in the process. But, um, I, but the uh, impression, indeed, I got at the time of my report was that uh, the level of staff lack of confidence in the system was pretty dire compared with some other sectors which is slightly surprising, but that seems to be the case. And uh, a lot of work, positive work, needs to be done. W one of the issues that I found really quite surprising was how difficult it was for me to find examples of good practice which had seen being successful to put in my report. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason for that being, it can't be that there are no, were no examples, it's that just that the good places just shrugged their shoulders and thought what they were doing was a matter of routine and didn't bother to collect data about it even. And I think that we do need far more at a local level of, of, of leaders recognising the value of what they hear from, from their staff, which will encourage not only their institutions, but others as well. Mm -hmm. On the, you know, you suggested that we, we had to stop people becoming victims of speaking up um, and blacklisting has been raised as an issue. What protections would you like to see put in place? Well, I, I recommended that uh, protection should be extended, uh, uh, legal protection, outside uh, the particular organisation in which the individual was working, so that people applying for jobs elsewhere in the National Health Service uh, should, um, um, should be protected, so they shouldn't be discriminated against when applying for a job because they had a history of speaking up in, in somewhere else. Um, our National Guardian has, in, in her response to the draft regulations about this, has suggested that this should be extended to um, um, all employers. In other words, you know, a whisper going to the non-NHS world, world, world should also be brought within the regulations. And I, that's more complicated, obviously, but I, I, I think that that wouldn't be a bad thing. So I, I, I've recommended that the, also that the uh, protection under the Public Interest Disclosure Act should be extended to trainees and students that's been done in part in the sense that in people who are the equivalent of an employer where the trainee is working uh, have, um, uh, are covered by the law. 
it, it's not clear that um, the train that the, 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 the sort of bu bureaucratic centre of organisations, Health Education England, and so on, are all, are similarly covered. But I think the, the, these are sort of technicalities that apply to England. I don't know whether they apply to Scotland. Can I ask one more uh, question? There seem to be um, specific key differences with the City of Edinburgh Council model. Um, it, it does sound quite positive. I'd be, uh, I'd like to understand if the panel are aware of what is going on in Edinburgh, and also if you believe that the National Confidential Alert Line should have further powers to investigate cases. I mean, I, I the National Confidential Alert Line is an alert, is a, an advice line for staff. So mm -hmm. it's one part of the jigsaw. I don't think it was ever commissioned on the basis that um, Expo Link, which is a private company, run the um, alert line or the, the, the reporting line. It's actually a reporting line that Edinburgh have. So the individual can report to Expo Link. They can report it back into. But, but it's got an investigation arm as well. Is that right? Um, yeah. It, it isn't that organisation. Um, oh, yes, sorry. Oh, uh, we have an independent hotline, so colleagues are able to independently um, contact. It's actually run by a, a company called Safe Call. They can contact that company directly. And where there's a major disclosure, for example, something where there is a, an actual PDA matter, breach of legislation, a health and safety, or matter of significant concern, that independent organisation under policy can step in to investigate and report via the corporate leadership team, chief executive and scrutiny committee. So is it, it, the, 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 the alert line that we run is an advice line. So it's legally privileged. It works on a, on a basis of consent. If the individual wants us to report something for them, we can take, pick that up on their behalf. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is help them to report it themselves and give them some independent advice. So they're not making a disclosure to public consent at work to the alert line, they are seeking advice in a, an absolute confidential space. So it's a very, very different model and is complementary to the kind of service that Edinburgh have in terms of being a reporting line. Um, because if you, or a reporting line or an investigation line, it, it's a different model mm -hmm. and you need both probably. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that, that one is better than the other in terms of a, a model. Um, in, in financial services, many organisations are now looking at reporting lines and advice lines as well. So it's, it's, it's one part of the jigsaw as opposed to being an exclusive, best, one, size is, one, one model is better than the other model. So this may be why then we have a petition in, you know, before Parliament at the moment calling for a hotline rather than a helpline. Yeah. Uh -huh. they're, they're Different mm -hmm. um, and they're complementary. I, I would agree that both is, is a good idea, um, I, I, and it's other industries or commercial sectors tend to have a, an external hotline, which is says that the someone can speak to somebody in complete confidence, and, and there's a better, uh, as it were, guarantee of anonymity. Um, whether that's necessary in the health service context depends a bit. I mean, the, something as large as the NHS in England you would like to think that it would be possible to place the service within it, but um, that's a matter of opinion. Okay. Thank you. Hurry. Thank you. Um, I work... At, um, I'm a member of the pharmacy profession, and I, um, that's a profession which is regulated by the General Pharmaceutical Council, and until very recently I worked in NHS Highland until last year when I was elected for 20 years. During the time I worked as a clinical pharmacist, I saw the culture within the NHS really transformed um, into a much more open culture and the duty of candour much more emphasised within the professions. Um, and I think that was not as a result, uh, when I raised this a couple of weeks ago, as one of my colleagues said, of there being more things to be concerned about. I think that genuinely was a cultural shift in terms of understanding from some of the really huge and terrible scandals that have hit the NHS of just how important it is for professionals to speak up when they have concerns. Um, what I'm wondering is what you think this duty of candour to all NHS staff will add, because I wonder if the professions haven't already, you know, the professions do already have a duty of candour. Um, are the professions not speaking up, and would extending that to all NHS staff make a difference? What difference do you think that will make? My understanding is that the duty of candour, which comes in, I think, April 18, 
is actually, though the legislation defines a responsible person, it's not actually an individual. So in the specific case, it would be NHS Highland rather than an individual employee would be the responsible person. So it's really about, I think, the public getting a total honesty from the organisation that they have an issue with. Can I just uh, say this, that, that my IRA calls recommended a legal duty of candour. Um, there was already and has been for decades a, a professional duty mm -hmm. of candour, but I'm afraid that that didn't help the patients in Mid Staffordshire. I, mm -hmm. I met senior consultants, I remember one in particular, who would only see me in the confines of his own home in secret because he was so afraid of what he had to tell me, when actually what he had to tell me I already knew because of the people that told me. Uh, the other point is that the professional duty of candour puts the entire burden on the individual, whereas what is actually required is often an organisational response uh, to the particular issue. It, and the final point I'd make is that the duty of candour, which it, it, we need to be careful what we're talking about, the legal duty of candour is about candour to a patient about something that has gone wrong. But I also recommended, which is just as importantly, a, 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 a duty to be open and transparent on the part of the organisation about its work generally. In other words, that we shouldn't only be told by the board of a hospital the good news, but also a, a recognition of whatever the problems are that they need to solve. And it seems to me that if you have that sort of uh, uh, culture amongst the leadership, it becomes much easier for people elsewhere in the organisation to talk about and raise issues of concern. I mean, I would, I would agree entirely. And one thing that we see on the advice line is that sometimes that duty to report gets used against the whistleblower or adds to a culture of silence because if somebody doesn't is a bit worried or, or, wor or, or, or more than a bit worried is scared about reporting and there's a bad culture in an organisation, one brave soul speaks up. Others then follow when it's clear that the organisation is listening. But we've seen cases where, because of a duty perhaps in the care industry that's put into a contract to report, individuals have then been disciplined for failing to report um, in the context of a really, really bad culture. So I think we have to be careful of unintended consequences because it can be used as a stick. And I really, I really agree professionals definitely should have a duty, but, it, but be careful about putting that, imposing that on all staff across the entire system. Thank you very much. That's really clarified things for me. Um, I'm very interested in this idea, as you say, not just of reporting to the patient when things have gone wrong, but reporting up. And I wonder what system is going to be in place to kind of collect and gather, because I, I, I can only imagine that in some of these really bad scandals, what, what was happening was that people were speaking about it and reports were being, con you know, concerns were being raised, but somehow the big picture wasn't being put together. Absolutely correct. In Mid Staffordshire, many staff were c reporting incidents and attributing them to, for instance, a lack of staffing, and then the pushback would be to dis discourage them from using that as a reason for the, the relevant incident. Um, I, I think you can only seek to deal with this by, by some sort of process of audit, inspection or oversight, uh, um, because if, unless you get under the bonnet of the relevant organisation, um, you're, you're never going to find, find, find the truth in that regard. So that's why you need the transparency uh, to see that not only do, are they receiving reports, but what on earth are they doing about them? And uh, that, that's, that's a board responsibility in most places. And can I add, if I was going to criticise the Scottish system, part of that is that numbers of reports to the advice line is what is being considered as whether the system is working. That's not what should be looked at. It's numbers going to people on the boards, numbers that the boards are getting from their own staff, numbers that their managers are dealing with. And sometimes that can be difficult to track. I mean, I, I'm not in, uh, you know, you can really over -bureauc bureaucratize this. You need your managers to have discretion to deal with things. But how do you capture that really, really good business as usual organisational operations. And that's where a little bit of um, thinking about how you capture that, how you do a review, how you structure the review, how you ask your staff will pay dividends in the long run. And you know that's where the, maybe the national officer will have some influence to help boards to do that work. It isn't about what's going to an external organisation, it's about what's going to the board. In, term, in terms of reporting to, to the board, we will be getting quarterly reports to the board 
and periodically we're going to have an in-committee session where we do a deep dive into an individual case where we can discuss things that can't be looked at in public. Could, could I just ask, because I forgot to mention it, that um, our, our National Guardian um, has started this <coughs> survey of all the local guardians and um, has just received actually the first set of results have not been um, analysed properly yet, but um, uh, that she's discovered that 25% or thereabouts of all concerns that have got to the guardians, which of course is only a fraction, one would hope, of the total level of concerns, are about patient safety. Uh, and um, so she will, as I understand it, be analysing in future as we go forward, uh, for hearing from the guardians about what has happened about these these concerns, and therefore, a, a, and she is not, I emphasise, a regulator, but she is someone who has access, as it were, to this information via the Guardian network, uh, and that is a sort of less bureaucratic way, perhaps, than setting up an inspectorate to go around look, actually looking at things. Yeah, just, uh, just one by saying I think there can be a challenge in bringing together a whole lot of information in a very complex and large organisation. I think it is important that we give uh, careful consideration to how we bring together the incident uh, reporting uh, through our DATEC system, significant clinical incidents, whistleblowing reports, complaints, ombudsman's reports, reflections that committees have on individual cases, and how we bring together the work of, for example, in relation to staff governance and also clinical governance, and that we get that bigger, bigger picture that can then be, you know, complemented by specific uh, reviews or, or surveys or whatever. So it's about I think being able to bring together that whole picture is really is really important. Can, can I ask one final, very quick something? <laughs> um, you mentioned there the DATIC system, um, and that was something I was very familiar with using when I worked in hospital. I understand that that's not something that's used in primary care. It's a different system, and I just wonder how the two work together. Uh, yeah. uh, my, my experience is more with the, with the acute sector and the independent contractors have their uh, means of, of recording incidents and will use... Uh, use measures, but we do through our monitoring of independent contractors, we do through clinical governance um, have uh, access to, to that information. I could certainly ask uh, my colleague who leads on clinical governance to, to provide information to the committee on that. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, Jenny? Or good afternoon, rather. Um, in terms of NHS culture, um, Monag Brown, you spoke about that at the start of your submission and how important that is in terms of developing a culture whereby folk feel they're able to speak out when they can. Um, the committee previously took evidence from the Scottish Ambulance Service and uh, only 20% of staff there felt consulted about changes at their work from the, the staff uh, survey. Nearly a half uh, hadn't had a staff review in the past year. But most importantly, in terms of whistleblowing, they had the lowest figures nationally in terms of uh, NHS boards with only 31% saying that they felt safe to speak up. So I really want to ask the panel if they're aware of any boards being tackled in terms of staff governance on these issues when it's flagged up in the staff survey. I know that's quite specific. So are you aware of any action being taken in terms of uh, these kind of figures? Sorry, not specifically in terms of the ambulance. No, services. I know that's quite yeah, specific no, that's in like, terms of the ambulance um, service. No. It just feels to me that there was quite a disconnect when we took evidence from them previously. So I suppose, what's the point of carrying out that survey if there's not going no, to be action at the end of it? Certainly the information from our, our staff survey, along with other indicators and other drivers, is yeah. what prompted us in staff governance to set up the sub the subgroup uh, to, mm -hmm. to look at how we reshape and, and refresh our, our culture. There's also the I Matter survey, yeah. which um, certainly in our area and I think commonly across uh, Scotland has had much higher response rates. I think we're at something like 64, 4% response rate on I Matters. Yeah. And that's a much more responsive survey. Um, and uh, higher responses. It's more responsive because it's much more immediate feedback to a team and it allows a team and the management uh, within that team to uh, to basically to reflect and test the temperature of their of their culture mm -hmm. and to work together to change that. Mm -hmm. So those are the so yes, certainly the information we get from surveys helps us in the in the big picture, yeah. large scale cultural change, but also as a matter of uh, managing and re responding to and creating open and discursive de team cultures. Then the I Matter survey is is very important to that. Okay. I think one of the real challenges for a board 
is actually knowing the temperature at the front line. Mm -hmm. So I think it's essential. I think this was touched on in Sir Robert's uh, report that in, in Highland, we have a thing called the Highland Quality Approach, which is a, a full fat version of lean methodology. <laughs> and it, it, it uses phrases like GEM, but it's, it's based on the Toyota working principles. So part of that, the non-executive directors and the board members are encouraged to go on the GEMBA regularly where you do have informal chats with frontline staff mm -hmm. and take time to actually just mingle with them and, and hear what they're saying. You know, it's not the answer, but it does help to give you a feeling of the pressures at the front line. Just on that point, thank you, Computer. Um, do you think there's perhaps capacity there to use that as an example of good practice and share it with other boards in terms of how folk can learn from that in terms of developing that culture that is supportive? Well, I, you know, I wouldn't claim that we're unique in that. I think we're probably, once we've taken it further, we have senior staff trained at Virginia Mason Hospital in the States and there's an interchange of staff there. So I think we've probably taken it a degree further than us, but I'm not suggesting for a moment that other boards are not doing mm -hmm. something okay. similar. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Claire. Thank you, Convener, and uh, thank you to the panel for coming along today. Um, the committee received a, a written submission um, quoting actually yourself, Sir Robert, uh, calling into question the independence of uh, whistleblowing champions who are employed by the authorities that, that the whistle is being blown on. Um, and I, if I can quote here, uh, uh, Sir Robert Francis in his freedom to speak up review following the mid-staff's inquiry stated that these appointments should be seen by all as independent, fair and impartial, and that they should not be adjunct <coughs> to existing posts. Um, I wonder if the, the uh, non-execs uh, who are whistleblowing champions uh, with NHS boards, if they uh, could maybe comment on how they reconcile their different roles and if they see there are any pitfalls to them being board members also. After you, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> see, I, you know, I think it's... it's just implicit in the role of a non-exec. You know, if I thought I was a board member to do what the executive board members think I should do, then the whole system's failed. You know, I'm there to form my own views about something and act on it. I think that that's right, and we are um, appointed by the minister, and we, we have that uh, independence and... We uh, certainly should be uh, able to, to speak up and to, to challenge, and, uh, and I think we, we do. But I can understand why, you know, members of the public or people who have had bad experiences elsewhere or whatever um, could have con concerns about that and why there's a, a, a public potential for public perception or concerns about independence. I think the independent national officer can offer some assistance in reconciling. Um, with that, in as much as there will be the the new the guidance, uh, there will be an opportunity, I would think, for the independent uh, national officer to to monitor and to benchmark board's uh, performance and and uh, openness and transparency in relation to to whistleblowing. Uh, produce perhaps national materials and training uh, for 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 whistleblowers. I think there's also been some consideration as to whether the independent national officer becomes a final stage in uh, uh, the whistleblowing process as a final uh, independent stage. And I think there could also be potential in that role uh, to provide a forum for patients in the public um, around whistleblowing and, and, and it's, uh, how, it's, how it's responded to and its independence when raising concerns, but also a forum for staff who've got, who've got concerns or had experiences in that, that area that they would want to, want to talk about. So I think yes, that, that, that may well be a, 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 an area to do that, but I'm keen to explore a bit more about your role. Um, as a, as a non-exec sitting on a board. So how do you um, convince uh, NHS staff that you are neutral, that you are, are not part of the system, that perhaps they are part, are part of the culture that perhaps they have concerns about? I mean, as, as Robin said, uh, uh, our, our appointment process would, would 
you know, just that independence, but also in terms of how we are handling the business, about how we, I mean, in terms of some of the issues that I've uh, dealt with or some of the scrutiny, I've, I've raised the level of investigation, I've um, highlighted limitations in investigations, and I think we have our own personal integrity uh, in, in terms of being open and transparent and to and, and challenging systems. And how does that transfer to staff on the ground, or how, how, how has that message got to them? I think um, we were talking earlier about how we uh, develop our communications with uh, with staff uh, through our various uh, newsletters, through uh, roadshows, through visibility of um, non-exec directors, visibility of senior managers, and how we convey our openness in the in the system. I think that possibly is. Uh, you've maybe touched on something that does need a bit more explanation to staff. It is explained in the whistleblowing policies, which tend to be relatively standard across all boards, that the whistleblowing champion who's not named in the policy, just mentioned, they're not part of the investigatory process at all, so they're divorced from it. Our role is actually to oversee process. As part of that, I do a kind of exit interview with any whistleblowers to try and find out how the, the system could be improved. But yeah, I think that we probably do need to explain a little bit better to staff what our, and to, to emphasise the independent nature of our view of it. And how long have, have you been in that role? A, just over a year, I would say. It is a relatively new thing altogether. So, and, and for, for yourself, Moran? Similarly, I think that's right, what Robin's saying is we also need to explain what we're not. We don't actually do the investigations or have part of that, of that process. It's an assurance role. So the, the, that assurance role has only been there for a year? Yes. Well, whistleblowing, the whole, the whole thing's only been there for about okay. a little bit over a year. And can I ask, because Robert, as I quoted you at the start of this, if, if perhaps you could share your opinion on a, the appointment of non-executive directors at board level being the whistleblowing champions? Well, not, I'm not, not going to speak about the situation not, not, in not Scotland, but I speak more generally from England. Um, what, what I had in... I, I, I did not have in... I've got to choose my words carefully. I did not have in mind when I made this recommendation that it should be the same as the role of a non-executive director in terms of a whistleblowing process, because at the time I wrote my report, many trusts had a board director who had a split part whistleblowing, if you like, as part of their portfolio and oversight of the whistleblowing process. I recommended a guardian because what it seemed to me was you needed someone in every organisation who had the confidence of the staff who had the confidence of the management and who was able to, uh, uh, where there were problems, unlock the right door to make sure there was a solution. Now, that could be in different organisations, there were going to be different solutions. This was a novel recommendation, so I didn't go very much deeper than that. Every trust in England now has a, a freedom to speak up guardian, and they come from a wide range of backgrounds. Some are non-executive directors. Time will tell whether that works or whether it doesn't. Uh, the concern some people have, and I think we have to, to look at this, is that, of course, a non-executive director has a corporate responsibility in relation to the running of the organisation, mm -hmm. which may be seen by some as conflicting with helping or, or providing oil to the wheels, as it were, of a system where that organisation is being challenged. Mm -hmm. And one can see that. I, can't, I won't say it's impossible, uh, but, and I think we need to work that out. But um, I, I would emphasise that who is the right person to be a guardian may be as much a matter of their personal qualities and the way they're respected throughout an organisation rather than what position they actually hold in it. But I think time will tell. Can I, I think that the model in Scotland was deliberately different in that the whistleblowing champion is an oversight role, not an operational role, whereas the freedom to speak up guardian is an operational role. So they are in a position where they are expected to help and protect the whistleblower and get the information and the the the, um, the wrongdoing or malpractice addressed and investigated and addressed. So it's a very different role, the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian, mm -hmm. to the whistleblowing champion. I think there is confusion around where, where there is a case that hasn't, the 
perception is it's not been dealt with properly or it hasn't been dealt with properly. Where is the top of the tree in the organisation? I think many NHS staff in any organisation would think, well, there's a whistleblowing champion, I'll go to them. And if they then get told, no, 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 we can't deal with you, then that undermines the trust um, very quickly. And, and there's, there's academic research all over the world around this being about trust. And it's so hard to build up that trust and so easy to lose it that, you know, whistleblowing systems need to be very flexible and have multi-channels and not to have barriers. Um, and I think that kind of, that sometimes that sort of protection of the senior person can create the barrier um, that, that, that undermines the system. It, it, uh, just, just for clarification, then, because it, obviously, if you if you have whistleblowing champions, the perception is that 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 you guys then are the ones who oversee this. But I'm hearing that you don't oversee this. You have no op, you have no operational responsibility for this. So, what what is your role? How how is to oversee process and in the whistleblowing policies, it is. Certainly in Highland, and I think in other boards, it's quite clearly defined what the role is. So to oversee policy? No, to oversee, sorry, when we said policy, process. Oversee the process, yeah. sorry. So, so what authority do you have if the process isn't being followed? And how do you know the process isn't being followed? Well, if I wasn't satisfied with process, and I haven't been, in a very, very few cases in Highland, but I haven't been, I've suggested changes and I keep suggesting them until they're implemented. If I get general agreement, I, I discuss it with the Staff Governance Committee, the Chair of Staff Governance, the Chair of the Board, and then, you know, I assume it's agreed and then we, we do it. So you keep suggesting them, uh, suggesting until it's changed. Sounds like there is some resistance to... Well, it's, it's, a, cons it's a consensual change at the end of the day. So I, I keep trying to make my point, hoping that other people will agree, and then we do change the process. Okay. So as a whistleblowing champion, then, what authority do you have? To try and influence change where I see the process isn't working properly. Okay. Two areas. Firstly, Jenny Gilruth mentioned the Scottish Ambulance Service. And I have to say one of the most startling figures that I picked up from the papers was this, I think, less, less than a third of staff feel it's safe to, to speak up. Um, and I wondered if anyone had any observations on that, given the importance of the ambulance service. Um, and uh, my other question was to return to the duty of candour, and the legal duty of candour, and to ask, uh, from a technical point of view, how, how is that to be enforced is it, and in terms of sanctions and remedy for the people involved? And, yeah, and, really and linked, to that, linked to that, one of the most interesting tensions, it seems to me, is the relationship between institutions or organisations taking responsibility and, and individuals. And you've, uh, I think, Cathy, hinted at, at that. But it strikes me that that's um, very difficult in terms of you know, a, a board or, or, or a, um, some kind of organisation fronting up to a failing uh, and an individual. And I just wondered if, you, if that could be explored as briefly as, as possible. I mean, I think we would we would say there is an absolute lack of accountability for those that have meted out retribution or retaliated against a whistleblower. We very rarely see any sanction against decisions that are made where whistleblowers have been treated badly. Um, and that can, you know, if you had a will within the senior leadership of an organisation to take that seriously and do something about it, then you change that perception that nothing changes. So, uh, but, you know, I don't have a magic bullet, I'm afraid. I, I, you know, it is time and again in all of the scandals that we see that hit the public sector, private sector, accountability is what people see as missing. And if we never see any accountability, then people will endlessly fail to trust it, the system. I think that, that's such a big question that I don't think it could be answered if you had all the time in the day. There's, al there's also, picking up what was said there, there's also the issue of unintentional detriment. If someone, for all the best reasons, raises a whistleblowing concern in a ward setting, inevitably the relationships, whether it, assuming it's not proved to be correct, but it was done with good intention, the relationship within that ward area, if it was a ward, breaks down and the person quite often has to be moved from that area. Now, they have done nothing wrong, so we have to find a system that allows and understand some work is happening with health improvement in England just now to try and find a way of making that happen, but we do need to address that situation as well. This is a re-employment scheme in, in England that's being worked through at the moment. I think it's very much in pilot stages, but it is, it is actually operating. 
Um, accountability is is important, but uh, and, uh, but can I just say one thing about the cultural matter, though, which is that uh, um, th this is actually about people making the right decisions in the interests of their patients and the NHS generally, uh, and clearly victimising a person, a whistleblower, a person who's raised a concern, is the absolute antithesis of that. Sometimes they've done that almost because of legal advice. There's a sort of adversarial culture that we need to get away from. But I, I do, do think that where at a senior level someone has actually proven to have acted in the way that I've just described, then there should be a means of ho holding them to account. And part of the problem we have is that in our country, uh, managers of the NHS are, are not subject to the degree of regulation that uh, healthcare professional, registered healthcare professionals are. Uh, and I do think in a general term that's perhaps something that needs to be looked at. Uh, males. Thank you, Convener. I just wanted to pick up um, on this specific question about people who are having, uh, you know, whistleblowing um, aspect in actually in looked into. And how many people do you feel are currently NHS employees who have been suspended or signed off due to stress or who are on gardening leave and they haven't had that complaint actually looked into but are still being paid by the health service? It's an area I've been trying to... Um, get numbers on but not had any luck and I wondered just how many people are suspended currently. I don't have specific numbers but we've done a piece of research that looked at this kind of whistleblower's journey of a thousand of our cases and it was certainly the case that in the public sector and in the NHS specifically in the health sector more people were suspended. In the private sector more people are dismissed. Now we're not looking at, we're looking at a skewed sample because people are coming to us when they're in difficulty with this issue but that's, that is a trend that we've seen from the statistics. I don't have absolute numbers I'm afraid. Could you provide the committee a Scottish breakdown I, of that? Or? I suspect not very easily but I can have a go. I'll, I'll, I'll have a look at what we've got in our system because we're not, we're not a regulator and we're a small charity that advises individuals sure. so we don't collect that data but I can have a look. Thanks. Couple issues I would like to raise uh, at the end. Um, we, uh, um, Alison Johnson mentioned the issue of blacklisting. I've been heavily involved in the issue around blacklisting in the construction industry, and I, I am absolutely of the opinion that some form of this operates within the health service, not on a formal basis like it did in the uh, construction industry. But if you look at the case of Dr. Hamilton, who gave evidence, uh, who provided evidence to us, I was involved in her case. She had an unblemished record in the health service as a, as a psychiatrist and was very well respected until she blew the whistle and she eventually lost her job. And despite there being a huge need for psychiatrists in Scotland and vacancies all over the place, she cannot get employed in Scotland. Um, is that a coincidence? Do people, are you seeing that happening elsewhere? Because I think that Scotland's a small place. It only takes a HR official half an hour to phone round the 12 other boards or whatever it is and say, what do you think What do you think of this one? Oh, don't take that. Nothing official, nothing written down, but the system could easily operate like that. Is that happening elsewhere? I think I can, I can honestly answer no, not to my knowledge, but I can only speak for the board. The second part of that was important, not the, to your knowledge. The, well, I can only speak for the board that I work in, but you know, your, your, your hypothesis implies a fairly large degree of collusion. If we're talking about relatively senior clinicians here, it won't be an HR person that appoints them. So you're suggesting that the information Definitely. on this person, I'm not saying it's not happening, you know, I'm not dismissing what you're saying, but it would have to be quite a sophisticated collusion because the appointment panel would usually be three or four people, etc. It's... I find it hard to believe, but I'm certainly not dismissing it, but I certainly have no but the example personal... I would give, in that, and this is all in the public domain, so I'm not uh, giving away any secrets, but there was, I think, a, a, a number of vacancies in one health board area. Um, and when uh, this person applied for those vacancies, those vacancies suddenly didn't exist anymore. Now, these things just lead you to all sorts of conspiracy theories and all the rest of it, but it clearly seems to be an issue there. I mean, I think it does exist, blacklisting. If you get the label of a whistleblower, it's a label of a troublemaker, and that's why we've always campaigned to have the kind of provision that Sir Robert recommended around uh, uh, the same rights you have around discrimination pre-employment 
you know, to, to, to say that I've actually not been offered that job. The, the problem with the legal protection is until you're in the job, <laughs> you don't get the right. Okay. So, yeah. and, and there is, I think it has been changed or it's, 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 it's pardon? It's on the way to being changed. It's on the way to being changed for health only. And I imagine that applies to Scotland because it's the Public Interest Disclosure Act. So it's a piece of, um, it definitely applies in Scotland, not in Northern Ireland. But um, I don't see why that isn't applied across the entire piece of legislation. The legislation protects all workers. Why would you say it's only a problem in health? I think it's a, a problem in all sectors. Um, and I think there is one other point around the staff computerised records. Um, and there's certainly some whistleblowers looking at how the back end of the staff computerised record is an unofficial way to record information that managers put on their systems. I don't know whether it's just England. I don't know what the system here is in Scotland, but there's definitely a sense that information that is not subject to a subject access request is sitting in those databases that, that ends up being very detrimental to somebody who's looking for a job elsewhere. I will hold could, my, I, could I just, I'm sorry, uh, just say, say this, that if, if someone, and I do not know about the case you mentioned, but if someone with that sort of experience was of colour and didn't get jobs, there'd be an automatic uh, question mark, at least, about whether that was racial discrimination. And I, I believe that whistleblowing, well, whatever you want to call it, should be treated in the same way. And where someone has been refused jobs by a public sector organisation in particular, uh, then there ought to be a reverse burden of proof. Why is this otherwise perfectly qualified individual not got a job? Can I ask a final point? Is there do you, any evidence or has there been people whistleblowing who are actually members of boards we get them all the time yes do you yeah from not just health but across all sectors we get board members yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm certainly talk well. specifically talking about health yes. sorry i'm specifically talking about health um i would imagine so i mean i'm talking i i haven't got any specific case in my mind but we certainly get board Okay. You're really senior level whistleblowers, definitely. You can read my report about uh, a whistleblower who gave evidence to me from the board of the Care Quality Commission quite effectively. Yes. Okay, thank you very much for your evidence. It'll be very interesting this morning. Uh, we also spend. Uh, oh, sorry, we now go into private session. <laughs>